It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. There was a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There was a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. It was the year of our Lord, 1775. France, less favoured on the whole as to matters spiritual than her sister of the shield and trident, rolled with exceeding smoothness downhill, making paper money and spending it. It is likely enough that in the rough outhouses of some tillers of the heavy lands adjacent to Paris, there were sheltered from the weather that very day, rude carts bespattered with rustic mire, snuffed about by pigs and roosted in by poultry, which the farmer death had already set apart to be his tumbrils of the revolution. In England there was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. Daring burglaries by armed men and highway robberies took place in the capital itself every night. The Lord Mayor of London was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman who despoiled the illustrious creature in sight of all his retinue. Prisoners in London jails fought battles with their turnkeys. These things and a thousand like them came to pass in and close upon the dear old year 1775. Thus did the year conduct the great and myriads of small creatures, the creatures of this chronicle among the rest, along the roads that lay before them. It was the Dover Road that lay on a Friday night late in November, before the first of the persons with whom this history has business. The Dover Road lay as to him beyond the Dover Mail, as it lumbered up Shooter's Hill. He walked uphill in the mire by the side of the mail, as the rest of the passengers did. Not because they had the least relish for walking exercise under the circumstances, but because the hill and the harness and the mud and the mail were all so heavy that the horses had three times already come to a stop. Besides once drawing the coach across the road with a mutinous intent of taking it back to Blackheath. Two other passengers, besides the one, were plodding up the hill by the side of the mail. All three were wrapped to the cheekbones and over the ears and wore jackboots. Not one of the three could have said from anything he saw what either of the other two was like. And each was hidden under almost as many wrappers from the eyes of the mind as from the eyes of the body of his two companions. In those days, travellers were very shy of being confidential on a short notice, for anybody on the road might be a robber or in league with robbers. The last burst carried the mail to the summit of the hill. The horses stopped to breathe again. The guard got down to skid the wheel for the descent and opened the coach door to let the passengers in. It's Joe, cried the coachman in a warning voice, looking down from his box. What do you say, Tom? They both listened. I say horse at a canter coming up, Joe. I say horse at a gallop, Tom, returned the guard leaving his hold on the door and mounting nimbly to his place. Gentlemen, in the king's name, all of you. With this hurried adjuration, he cocked his blunderbuss and stood on the offensive. The sound of a horse at a gallop came fast and furiously up the hill. So ho, the guard sang out as loud as he could roar. You there, stand, I shall fire. The pace was suddenly checked. and With much splashing and floundering, a man's voice called from the mist, is that a Dover mail? Why do you want to know? The guard retorted. I want a passenger if it is. What passenger? Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Our booked passenger showed in a moment that it was his name. The guard, the coachman and the two other passengers eyed him distrustfully. What is the matter? asked the passenger. And then with mildly quavering speech, who wants me? Is it Jerry? Yes, Mr. Lorry. What is the matter? A dispatch sent to you from over yonder, T and Co. I know this messenger, guard, said Mr. Lorry, getting down into the road, assisted from behind more swiftly than politely by the two other passengers, who immediately scrambled into the coach, shut the door, and pulled out the window. He may come close, there's nothing wrong. The figures of a horse and rider came slowly through the eddying mist and came to the side of the mail, where
where the passenger stood. The rider stopped, and casting up his eyes at the guard, handed the passenger a small folded paper. The rider's horse was blown, and both horse and rider were covered with mud from the hooves of the horse to the hat of the man. Guard, said the passenger, in a tone of quiet business confidence. The watchful guard, with his right hand at the stock of his raised blunderbuss, his left at the barrel, and his eye on the horseman, answered curtly, Sir, there is nothing to apprehend. I belong to Tilson's Bank. You must know Tilson's Bank in London. I am going to Paris on business. I may read this. Shall be as your quick, sir. He opened it in the light of the coach lamp on that side and read, first to himself and then aloud, Wait at Dover for Mademoiselle. It's not long, you see, guard. Jerry, say that my answer is recalled to life. Jerry started in his saddle. <laughs> That's a blazing strange answer, too, said he at his horsest. Take that message back, and they will know that I received this as well as if I wrote. Make the best of your way. Good night. With those words, the passenger opened the coach door and got in. The coach lumbered on again, with heavier wreaths of mist closing round it as it began the descent. When the mail had got successfully to Dover in the course of the forenoon, the head drawer at the Royal George Hotel opened the coach door as his custom was. The mildewy inside of the coach with its damp and dirty straw, its disagreeable smell and its obscurity was rather like a larger dog kennel. Mr. Lorry, the passenger, shaking himself out of it in chains of straw, a tangle of shaggy wrapper, flapping hat and muddy legs, was rather like a larger sort of dog. There will be a packet to Calais tomorrow, draw. Yes, sir, if the weather holds and the wind sits tolerable fair. The tide will serve pretty nicely at about two in the afternoon, sir. Bed, sir? I shall not go to bed till night, but I want a bedroom and a barber. Ah, and then bed for, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, that way, sir, if you please. The coffee room had no other occupant that forenoon than the passenger. His breakfast table was drawn before the fire, and as he sat with its light shining on him, waiting for the meal, he sat so still that he might have been sitting for his portrait. Soon, completing his resemblance to a man who was sitting for his portrait, Mr. Lorry dropped off to sleep. The arrival of his breakfast roused him, and he said to the drawer as he moved his chair to it, I wish accommodation prepared for a young lady who may come here at any time today. She may ask for Mr. Jarvis Lorry, or she may only ask for a gentleman from Tilson's Bank. Uh, please to let me know. Yes, sir. Tilson's Bank in London, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. We have oftentimes the honour to entertain your gentlemen in their travelling backwards and forwards betwixt London and Paris, sir. A vast deal of travelling, sir, in Tilson and Company's house. Yes, we are quite a French house as well as an English one. Yes, sir. Not much in the habit of such travelling yourself, I think, sir. Not of late years. It is fifteen years since we... since I last came from France. When Mr. Lorry had finished his breakfast, he went out for a stroll on the beach. The little narrow, crooked town of Dover hid itself away from the beach and ran its head into the chalk cliffs like a marine ostrich. The beach was a desert of heaps of sea and stones tumbling wildly about and the sea did what it liked, and what it liked was destruction. It thundered at the town and thundered at the cliffs and brought the coast down madly. As the day declined into the afternoon and the air, which had been at intervals clear enough to allow the French coast to be seen, became again charged with mist and vapour, Mr. Lorry's thoughts seemed to cloud too. When it was dark, as he sat before the coffee-room fire, his mind was busily digging, digging, digging in the live red coals. In a very few minutes the waiter came in to announce that Miss Manette had arrived from London and would be happy to see the gentleman from Tussons. So soon? Miss Manette had taken some refreshment on the road and required none then and was extremely anxious to see the gentleman from Tussons immediately if it suited his pleasure and convenience. The gentleman from Tellson's had nothing left for it but to empty his glass with an air of stolid desperation 
settle his odd little flaxen wig at the ears, and follow the waiter to Miss Manette's apartment. It was a large, dark room, furnished in a funereal manner with black horse hair, and loaded with heavy dark tables. These had been oiled and oiled, until the two tall candles on the table in the middle of the room were gloomily reflected on every leaf, as if they were buried in deep graves of black mahogany. And no light to speak of could be expected from them until they were dug out. The obscurity was so difficult to penetrate that Mr. Lorry, picking his way over the well-worn turkey carpet, supposed Miss Manette to be, for the moment, in some adjacent room, until, having got past the two tall candles, he saw standing to receive him by the table, between them and the fire, a young lady of not more than seventeen, in a riding cloak, and still holding her straw travelling hat by its ribbon in her hand. Pray take a seat, sir. In a very clear and pleasant young voice, a little foreign in its accent, but a very little indeed. I kiss your hand, miss, said Mr. Lorry, with the manners of an earlier date, as he made his formal bow again and took his seat. I received a letter from the bank yesterday, informing me that some intelligence or discovery... The word is not material, miss. Either word will do. Uh, respecting the small property of my poor father, whom I never saw so long dead, rendered it necessary that I should go to Paris, there to communicate with a gentleman of the bank, so good as to be dispatched to Paris for the purpose. Myself. Are you quite a stranger to me, sir? Am I not? Mr. Lorry opened his hands and extended them outwards with an argumentative smile. Hey, Miss Manette, I, I am a man of business. I have a business charge to acquit myself of, in your reception of it, don't heed me any more than if I was a speaking machine. And truly, I am not much more. I will, with your leave, relate to you, miss, the story of one of our customers. Story? He seemed willfully to mistake the word she had repeated when he added in a hurry, um, Yes, customers. In the banking business, we usually call our connection our customers. He was a French gentleman, a scientific gentleman, uh, a man of great acquaintance. A doctor. Not of Beauvais. Uh, why, yes, of Beauvais. Uh, like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of repute in Paris. I had the honour of knowing him there. Our relations were business relations, but confidential. I was at that time in our French house and had been, oh, twenty years. At that time? I may ask, at what time, sir? I speak, miss, of twenty years ago. He married an English lady, and I was one of the trustees. His affairs, like the affairs of many other French gentlemen and French families, were entirely in Tilson's hands. In a similar way, I am, or I have been, trustee of one kind or other for scores of our customers. These are mere business relations, miss. There is no friendship in them, no particular interest, nothing like sentiment. I have passed from one to another in the course of my business life, just as I pass from one of our customers to another in the course of my business day. In short, I, I have no feelings. I'm a mere machine. <clears throat> to go on. But this is my father's story, sir. And I begin to think that when I was left an orphan through my mother's surviving my father only two years, it was you who brought me to England. I'm almost sure it was you. Uh, Miss Manette, it was I. So far, miss, as you have remarked, this is the story of your regretted father. N now comes the difference. If your father had not died when he did, I, well, don't be frightened. How you do start? She did indeed start, and she caught his wrist with both her hands. As I was saying, if, if Monsieur Manette had not died... If he had suddenly and silently disappeared, if he had been spirited away, if it had not been difficult to guess to what dreadful place, though no art could trace him, if he had an enemy and some compatriot who could exercise a privilege that I in my own time have known the boldest people afraid to speak of in a whisper across the water there, if his wife had implored the king, the queen, the court, the clergy for any tidings of him, and all quite in vain, then 
history of your father would have been the history of this unfortunate gentleman, the doctor of Beauvais. I entreat you to tell me more, sir. I will. I am going to. Now, if this doctor's wife, though a lady of great courage and spirit, had suffered so intensely from this cause before her little child was born... The little child was a daughter, sir. A, a daughter. Miss, if the poor lady had suffered so intensely before her little child was born, that she came to the determination of sparing the poor child the inheritance of any part of the agony she had known the pains of, by rearing her in the belief that her father was dead. No, 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 don't kneel. In heaven's name, why should you kneel to me? For the truth, oh dear good compassionate sir, for the truth. Courage. Business. You have business before you. Useful business. Miss Manette, your mother took this course with you, and when she died, I believe broken-hearted, having never slackened her unavailing search for your father, she left you at two years old to grow to be blooming, beautiful, and happy, without the dark cloud upon you of living in uncertainty whether your father soon wore his heart out in prison or wasted there through many lingering years. You knew that your parents had no great possession and that what they had was secured to your mother and to you. There has been no new discovery of money or of any other property, but... But he has been... been found. He is alive. Greatly changed, it is too probable. Almost a wreck, it is possible. Though we will hope for the best. Still, alive. Your father has been taken to the house of an old servant in Paris, and we are going there. I to identify him, if I can. You to restore him to life, love, duty, rest, and comfort. A shiver ran through her frame, and from it through his. She said in a low, distinct, awe-stricken voice, as if she was saying it in a dream, I'm going to see his ghost. It will be his ghost, not him. Perfectly still and silent, and not even fallen back in her chair, she sat under his hand utterly insensible, with her eyes open and fixed upon him, and with that last expression looking as if it were carved or branded into her forehead. So close was her hold upon his arm that he feared to detach himself lest he should hurt her. Therefore he called out loudly for assistance without moving. A wild-looking woman came running into the room in advance of the inn servants and soon settled the question of his detachment from the poor young lady by laying a brawny hand upon his chest and sending him flying back against the nearest wall. She softly laid the patient on a sofa and tended her with great skill and gentleness, calling her my precious and my bird, and spreading her golden hair aside over her shoulders with great pride and care. I hope she will do well now, said Mr. Lorry. No thanks to you if she does. My darling pretty. I hope, said Mr. Lorry, after another pause of feeble sympathy and humility, that you accompany Miss Manette to France. A likely thing, too, replied the strong woman. If it was ever intended that I should go across salt water, do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot in an island? This being a question hard to answer, Mr. Jarvis Lorry withdrew to consider it. A large cask of wine had been dropped and broken in the street. The accident had happened in getting it out of a cart. The cask had tumbled out with a run, the hoops had burst, and it lay on the stones just outside the door of the wine shop, shattered like a walnut shell. All the people within reach had suspended their business, or their idleness, to run to the spot and drink the wine. The wine was red wine, and had stained the ground of the narrow street in the suburb of Saint Antoine in Paris, where it was spilled. It had stained many hands, too, and many faces, and many naked feet, and many wooden shoes. The wine shop was a corner shop, better than most others in its appearance and degree, and the master of the wine shop had stood outside it in a yellow waistcoat and green breeches, looking on at the struggle for the last wine. Well, it's not my affair, said he, with a final shrug of the shoulders. 
The people from the market did it. Let them bring another. The wine shopkeeper was a bull-necked, martial-looking man of thirty. And he should have been of a hot temperament, for although it was a bitter day, he wore no coat, but carried one slung over his shoulder. Good-humoured-looking on the whole, but implacable-looking too. Madame Defarge, his wife, sat in the shop behind the counter as he came in. Madame Defarge was a stout woman of about his own age, with a watchful eye that seldom seemed to look at anything, a large hand, heavily ringed, a steady face, strong features, and great composure of manner. Madame Defarge said nothing when her lord came in, but coughed, just one grain of cough. This, in combination with the lifting of her darkly defined eyebrows, suggested to her husband that he would do well to look around the shop among the customers for any new customer who had dropped in while he stepped over the way. The wine shopkeeper accordingly rolled his eyes about until they rested upon an elderly gentleman and a young lady who were seated in a corner. Other company were there, two playing cards, two playing dominoes, three standing by the counter, lengthening out a short supply of wine. As he passed behind the counter, he took notice that the elderly gentleman said in a look to the young lady, This is our man. What the devil do you do in that galley there? said Monsieur Defarge to himself. I don't know you. But he feigned not to notice the two strangers, and fell into discourse with the triumvirate of customers who were drinking at the counter. Finally, the three paid for their wine and left the place. The eyes of Monsieur Defarge was studying his wife at her knitting, when the elderly gentleman advanced from his corner and begged the favour of a word. Willingly, sir, said Monsieur Defarge, and quietly stepped with him to the door. Their conference was very short, but very decided. Almost at the first word, Monsieur Defarge started and became deeply attentive. It had not lasted a minute when he nodded and went out. The gentleman then beckoned to the young lady, and they too went out. Madame Defarge knitted with nimble fingers and steady eyebrows, and saw nothing. Mr. Jarvis Lorry and Miss Manette, emerging from the wine shop, joined Monsieur Defarge in the doorway to which he had directed his other company just before. It opened from a stinking little black courtyard, and was a general public entrance to a great pile of houses, inhabited by a great number of people. In the gloomy tile-paved entry was a gloomy tile-paved staircase. It is very high, it is a little difficult, better to begin slowly, said Monsieur Defarge in a stern voice to Mr. Lorry as they began ascending the stairs. Is he alone? the latter whispered. Alone? God help him, who should be with him? said the other in the same low voice. At last the top of the staircase was gained. There was yet an upper staircase, of a steeper inclination and of contracted dimensions to be ascended before the garret story was reached. They went up slowly and softly, and were soon at the top. With an admonitory gesture to keep them back, the keeper of the wine shop stopped and looked in through a crevice in the wall. The door slowly opened inward under his hand, and he looked into the room and said something. A faint voice answered something. Little more than a single syllable could have been spoken on either side. He looked back over his shoulder and beckoned them to enter. The garret, built to be a depository for firewood and the like, was dim and dark. It was difficult on first coming in to see anything. And long habit alone could have slowly formed in anyone the ability to do any work requiring nicety in such obscurity. Yet, work of that kind was being done in the garret. For with his back towards the door, and his face towards the window, where the keeper of the wine shop stood looking at him, a white-haired man sat on a low bench, stooping forward and very busy, making shoes. Good day, said Monsieur de Vage, looking down at the white head that bent low over the shoemaking. It was raised for a moment, and a very faint voice responded to the salutation, as if it were at a distance. Good day. You are still hard at work, I see. After a long silence, the head was lifted for another moment, and the voice replied, Yes, I am working. 
This time, a pair of haggard eyes had looked at the questioner before the face had dropped again. The faintness of the voice was pitiable and dreadful. Are you going to finish that pair of shoes today, said Defarge, motioning to Mr. Lloyd to come forward. What did you say? Do you mean to finish that pair of shoes today? I can't say that I mean to. I suppose so. I don't know. But the question reminded him of his work, and he bent over it again. Mr. Lorry came silently forward, leaving the daughter by the door. You have a visitor, you see, said Monsieur Defarge. What did you say? Here is a visitor. The shoemaker looked up as before, but without removing a hand from his work. Come, said Defarge. Here is Monsieur, who knows a well-made shoe when he sees one. Show him that shoe you are working at. Take it, Monsieur. Mr. Lorry took it in his hand. And tell Monsieur what kind of shoe it is. And the maker's name. Did you... Ask me for my name? Assuredly I did. One hundred and five North Tower. Is that all? One hundred and five North Tower. With a weary sound, there was not a sign or a groan. He began to work again, until the silence was again broken. You are not a shoemaker by trade? said Mr. Lorry, looking steadfastly at him. I'm not a shoemaker by trade. No, I was not a shoemaker by trade. I learnt it here. I taught myself. I asked leave to teach myself, and I got it with much difficulty after a long time. And I've made shoes ever since. Monsieur Manette... Mr. Lorry laid his hand upon Defarge's arm. Do you remember nothing of this man? Look at him. Look at me. Is there no old banker, no old business, no old servant, no old time rising in your mind, Monsieur Manette? As the captive of many years sat looking fixedly by turns at Mr. Lorry and at Defarge, some long obliterated marks of an actively intent intelligence in the middle of the forehead gradually forced themselves through the black mist that had fallen on him. They were overclouded again. They were fainter. They were gone. But they had been there. Now Lucy moved from the wall of the garret where she had been watching, very near to the bench on which he sat. He stared at her with a fearful look. And after a while his lips began to form some words, though no sound proceeded from them. By degrees, in the pauses of his quick and laboured breathing, he was heard to say, What, what is this? With the tears streaming down her face, she put her two hands to her lips and kissed them to him, then clasped them to her breast as if she laid his ruined head there. You are not the jailer's daughter. She sighed, no. Who are you? Not yet trusting the tones of her voice, she sat down on the bench beside him. He recoiled, but she laid her hand upon his arm. A strange thrill struck him when she did so, and visibly passed over his frame. He laid the knife down softly as he sat staring at her. Her golden hair, which she wore in long curls, had been hurriedly pushed aside and fell down over her neck. Advancing his hand by little and little, he took it up and looked at it. In the midst of the action he went astray, and with another deep sigh, fell to work at his shoemaking. But not for long. Releasing his arm, she laid her hand upon his shoulder. After looking doubtfully at it two or three times, as if to be sure that it was really there, he laid down his work, put his hand to his neck, and took off a blackened string with a scrap of folded rag attached to it. He opened this carefully on his knee, and it contained a very little quantity of hair, not more than one or two long golden hairs, which he had in some old day wound off upon his finger. 
He took her hair into his hand again and looked closely at it. It is the same. How can it be? When was this? How was it? He sank in her arms, and his face dropped on her breast. A sight so touching yet so terrible in the tremendous wrong and suffering which had gone before it, that the two beholders covered their faces. When the quiet of the garret had been long undisturbed, and his heaving breast and shaken form had long yielded to the calm that must follow all storms, emblem to humanity of the rest and silence into which the storm called life must hush at last, they came forward to raise the father and daughter from the ground. He had gradually dropped to the floor and lay there in a lethargy, worn out. She had nestled down with him that his head might lie upon her arms, and her hair drooping over him curtained him from the light. If, without disturbing him, she said, raising her hand to Mr. Lorry as he stooped over them, after repeated blowings of his nose, all could be arranged for our leaving Paris at once, so that from the very door he could be taken away. But consider, is he fit for the journey? asked Mr. Lorry. More fit for that, I think, than to remain in this city so dreadful to him. If you will lock the door to secure us from interruption, I do not doubt that you will find him, when you come back, as quiet as you leave him. In any case, I will take care of him until you return and then we will remove him straight. Mr. Lorry and Monsieur Defarge had made all ready for the journey, and had brought with them, besides travelling cloaks and wrappers, bread and meat and wine and hot coffee. Monsieur Defarge put his provender and the lamp he carried on the shoemaker's bench, and he and Mr. Lorry roused the captive and assisted him to his feet. In the submissive way of one long accustomed to obey under coercion, he ate and drank what they gave him to eat and drink, and put on the cloak and other wrappings that they gave him to wear. He readily responded to his daughter's drawing her arm through his, and took and kept her hand in both his own. They began to descend, Monsieur Defarge going first with the lamp, Mr. Lorry closing the little procession. No crowd was about the door, no people were discernible at any of the many windows, not even a chance passer-by was in the street. An unnatural silence and desertion reigned there. Only one soul was to be seen, and that was Madame Defarge, who leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing. The prisoner got into a coach, and his daughter followed him. Defarge got upon the box and gave the word, To the barrier! The postillion cracked his whip, and they clattered away under the feeble, over-swinging lamps. Five years passed since Mr. Lorry visited the garret room in St. Antoine and escorted Dr. Monette and his daughter back to London. Tellson's Bank, by Temple Bar, was an old-fashioned place, even in the year 1780. It was very small, very dark, very ugly, very incommodious, it was an old-fashioned place, moreover, in the moral attribute that the partners in the house were proud of its smallness, proud of its darkness, proud of its ugliness, proud of its incommodiousness. Outside Telson's, never by any means in it, unless called in, was an odd job man, an occasional porter and messenger, who served as the live sign of the house. He was never absent during business hours, unless upon an errand, and then he was represented by his son, a grisly urchin of twelve who was his express image. People understood that Telson's, in a stately way, tolerated the odd job man. His surname was Cruncher, and on the youthful occasion of his renouncing by proxy the works of darkness in the easterly parish church of Houndsditch, he had received the added appellation of Jerry. Encamped at a quarter before nine, in good time to touch his three-cornered hat to the oldest of men as they passed into Telson's, Jerry took up his station on a windy March morning with young Jerry standing by him, when not engaged in making forays through the bar to inflict bodily and mental injuries and of acute description on passing boys who were small enough for his amiable purpose. Father and son, extremely like each other, looking silently on at the morning traffic in Fleet Street, 
with their two heads as near to one another as the two eyes of each were, bore a considerable resemblance to a pair of monkeys. The head of one of the regular indoor clerks attached to Telson's establishment was put through the door and the word was given. Porter wanted. You know the old Bailey well, no doubt, said one of the oldest of the clerks to Jerry the messenger. Yes, sir, returned Jerry in something of a dogged manner. Or do know the Bailey. Just so. And you know Mr. Lorry, eh? Oh, no, Mr. Lorry, sir, much better than I know the Bailey. Very well. Find the door where the witnesses go in, and show the doorkeeper this note for Mr. Lorry. He will then let you in. As the ancient clerk deliberately folded and superscribed the note, Mr. Cruncher, after surveying him in silence until he came to the blotting paper stage, remarked, oh, I suppose it'll be trying forgeries this morning. Treason? Oh, that's quarter in, said Jerry. Barbarous. It is the law, remarked the ancient clerk, turning his surprised spectacles upon him. It is the law. They hanged at Tyburn in those days, so the street outside Newgate had not obtained one infamous notoriety that has since attached to it. But the Old Bailey was famous as a kind of deadly inn-yard, from which pale travellers set out continually, in carts and coaches, on a violent passage into the other world. Traversing some two miles and half of public street and road, and shaming few good citizens, if any. Making his way through the tainted crowd, dispersed up and down this hideous scene of action, with the skill of a man accustomed to make his way quietly, the messenger found the door he sought. After some delay and demur, the door grudgingly turned on its hinges a very little way, and allowed Mr. Jerry Cruncher to squeeze himself into the court. What's on? he asked in a whisper of the man he found himself next to. Nothing yet. Yeah. What's coming on? The treason case. Mr. Cruncher's attention was here diverted to the doorkeeper, whom he saw making his way to Mr. Lorry with a note in his hand. Mr. Lorry sat at a table among the gentlemen in wigs. After some gruff coughing and rubbing of his chin and signing with his hand, Jerry attracted the notice of Mr. Lorry, who had stood up to look for him, and who quietly nodded and sat down again. Presently, the dock became the central point of interest. Two jailers who had been standing there went out, and the prisoner was brought in and put to the bar. Everybody present stared at him. All the human breath in the place rolled at him like a sea or a wind or a fire. Eager faces strained round pillars and corners to get a sight of him, and spectators in back rows stood up not to miss a hair of him. The object of all this staring and blaring was a young man of about five and twenty, well-grown and well-looking, with a sunburnt cheek and a dark eye. His condition was that of a young gentleman. He was plainly dressed in black or very dark grey, and his hair, which was long and dark, was gathered in a ribbon at the back of his neck more to be out of his way than for ornament. He bowed to the judge and stood quiet. Silence in the court. Charles Darnay had yesterday pleaded not guilty to an indictment denouncing him for that he was a false traitor to our serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, Prince our Lord the King, and by reason of his having on divers occasions and by divers means and ways assisted Louis, the French King, in his wars against our said serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth. Over the prisoner's head there was a mirror to throw the light down upon him. Crowds of the wicked and wretched had been reflected in it, and had passed from its surface and this earth's together. Be that as it may, a change in his position, making him conscious of a bar of light across his face, he looked up. And when he saw the glass, his face flushed, and he looked away. It happened that the action turned his face to that side of the court which was on his left. And about on a level with his eyes, there sat in that corner of the judge's bench two persons upon whom his look immediately rested. So immediately, and so much to the changing of his aspect, that all the eyes that were turned upon him turned to them. The spectators saw in the two figures a young lady of little more than twenty, and a gentleman was evidently her father, a man 
a very remarkable appearance in respect of the absolute whiteness of his hair and a certain indescribable intensity of face, not of an active kind, but pondering and self-communing. Jerry the messenger, who had made his own observations in his own manner, stretched his neck to hear who they were. A crowd about him had pressed and passed the inquiry on to the nearest attendant, and from him it had been more slowly pressed and passed back. At last it got to Jerry. Witnesses. For which side? Against. Against what side? The prisoners. The judge whose eyes had gone in the general direction, recalled them, leaned back in his seat and looked steadily at the man whose life was in his hands. As Mr. Attorney General rose to spin the rope, grind the axe and hammer the nails into the scaffold. Mr. Attorney General had to inform the jury that the prisoner before them, though young in years, was old in the treasonable practices which claimed the forfeit of his life. That, it was certain, the prisoner had, for longer than that, been in the habit of passing and repassing between France and England on secret business of which he could give no honest account. But the evidence of two witnesses, coupled with documents of their discovering, would be produced, showing the prisoner to have been furnished with lists of His Majesty's forces, and of their disposition and preparation, both by sea and land. That these lists could not be proved to be in the prisoner's handwriting, that it was all the same, that indeed it was rather the better for the prosecution, as showing the prisoner to be artful in his precautions, that the proof would go back five years, and would show the prisoner already engaged in these pernicious missions within a few weeks before the date of the very first action fought between the British troops and the Americans, that for these reasons, the jury being a loyal jury, as he knew they were, and being a responsible jury, as they knew they were, must positively find the prisoner guilty and make an end of him, whether they liked it or not. When the Attorney General ceased, a buzz arose in the court as if a cloud of great blue flies was swarming about the prisoner, in anticipation of what he was soon to become. Mr. Attorney General then called Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Mr. Jarvis Lorry! Are you a clerk in Tilson's bank? I am. On a certain Friday night in November 1775, did business occasion you to travel between London and Dover by the mail? It did. Were there any other passengers in the mail? Two. Did they alight on the road in the course of the night? They did. Mr. Lorry, look upon the prisoner. Was he one of those two passengers? I cannot undertake to say that he was. Mr. Lorry, look once more upon the prisoner. Have you seen him to your certain knowledge before? I have. When? I was returning from France a few days afterwards, and at Calais the prisoner came on board the packet ship in which I returned and made the voyage with me. At what hour did he come on board? At a little after midnight. In the dead of the night. Was he the only passenger who came on board at that untimely hour? He happened to be the only one. Never mind about happening, Mr. Lorry. He was the only passenger who came on board in the dead of the night. Hmm? He was. Were you travelling alone, Mr. Lorry, or with any companion? With two companions, a gentleman and a lady. They are here. They are here. Had you any conversation with a prisoner? Hardly any. The weather was stormy and the passage long and rough, and I lay on a sofa almost from shore to shore. Miss Manette... The young lady, to whom all eyes had been turned before, and were now turned again, stood up where she had sat. Her father rose with her, and kept her hand drawn through his arm. Miss Manette, have you seen the prisoner before? Yes, sir. Where? On board of the packet ship just now referred to, sir, and on the same occasion. Miss Manette, had you any conversation with the prisoner on that passage across the channel? Yes, sir. Recall it. When the prisoner came on board, he noticed that my father was much fatigued and in a very weak state of health. The prisoner was so good as to beg permission to advise me how I could shelter my father from the wind and weather better than I had done. He expressed great gentleness and kindness for my father's state, 
and I'm sure that he felt it. That was the manner of our beginning to speak together. Let me interrupt you for a moment. Had he come on board alone? No. How many were with him? Two French gentlemen. Had they conferred together? They had conferred together until the last moment when it was necessary for the French gentlemen to be landed in their boat. Now to the prisoner's conversation, Miss Manette. For the prisoner was as open in his confidence with me, which arose out of my helpless situation, as he was kind and good and useful to my father. I hope, she said, bursting into tears, I may not repay him by doing him harm today. Buzzing from the blue flies. Mr. Attorney General now signified to my lord that he deemed it necessary as a matter of precaution and form to call the young lady's father, Dr. Manette, who was called accordingly. Dr. Manette, look upon the prisoner. Have you ever seen him before? Once, when he called at my lodgings in London, some three years or three years and a half ago. Can you identify him as your fellow passenger on board the packet, or speak of his conversation with your daughter? Sir, I can do neither. My mind is a blank from some time, I cannot even say what time, when I employed myself in my captivity, in making shoes, to the time when I found myself living in London with my dear daughter here. She had become familiar to me when a gracious God restored my faculties. But I am quite unable to say how she became familiar. I have no remembrance of the process. Mr. Attorney General sat down, and the father and daughter sat down together. A singular circumstance then arose in the case. The object in hand being to show that the prisoner went down with some fellow plotter untracked in the Dover mail on that Friday night in November five years ago and got out of the mail in the night as a blind at a place where he did not remain but from which he travelled back some dozen miles or more to a garrison and dockyard and there collected information. A witness was called to identify him as having been at the precise time required in the coffee-room of an hotel in that garrison and dockyard town, waiting for another person. The prisoner's counsel was cross-examining this witness with no result, except that he had never seen the prisoner or any other occasion, when a wigged gentleman, who had all this time been looking at the ceiling of the court, wrote a word or two on a little piece of paper, screwed it up, and tossed it to him. Opening this piece of paper in the next pause, the counsel looked with great attention and curiosity at the prisoner. You say again you are quite sure that it was the prisoner? The witness was quite sure. Did you ever see anybody very like the prisoner? Not so like the witness said, as that he could be mistaken. But look well upon that gentleman, my learned friend there, pointing to him who had tossed the paper over, and then look upon the prisoner. How say you? Are they very like each other? Allowing for my learned friend's appearance being careless and slovenly, if not debauched, they were sufficiently like each other to surprise not only the witness, but everybody present, when they were thus brought into comparison. My lord, being prayed to bid my learned friend to lay aside his wig, and giving no very gracious consent, the likeness became much more remarkable. My lord inquired of Mr. Stryver, the prisoner's counsel, whether they were next to try Mr. Carton, name of my learned friend, for treason. The upshot of which was to smash this witness like a crockery vessel and shiver his part of the case to useless lumber. Mr. Cruncher had by this time taken quite a lunch off his fingers in his following of the evidence. He had now to attend while Mr. Stryver fitted the prisoner's case on the jury like a compact suit of clothes showing them how the prosecution witness, John Barsad, was a hired spy and traitor, an unblushing trafficker in blood, and one of the greatest scoundrels upon earth since accursed Judas, which he certainly did look rather like, how the second, a Roger Cly, was his friend and partner, and was worthy to be, how the watchful eyes of these forgers and false swearers had rested on the prisoner as a victim, because some family affairs in France 
he being a French extraction, did require his making those passages across the channel. Though what those affairs were, a consideration for others who were near and dear to him forbade him even for his life to disclose. Mr. Stryver further showed the jury how the evidence that had been warped and wrested from the young lady, whose anguish in giving it they had witnessed, came to nothing, involving the mere little innocent gallantries and politenesses likely to pass between any young gentleman and young lady so thrown together. A great flies swarmed again. Mr. Carton, who had so long sat looking at the ceiling of the court, changed neither his place nor his attitude, even in this excitement. There was something especially reckless in his demeanour that gave him a disreputable look. Yet he took in more of the details of the scene than he appeared to take in. For now, when Miss Minette's head dropped upon her father's breast, he was the first to see it, and to say audibly, Officer, look to that young lady. Help the gentleman to take her out. Don't you see she will fall? There was much commiseration for her, as she was removed, and much sympathy with her father. It had evidently been a great distress to him to have the days of his imprisonment recalled. He had shown strong internal agitation when he was questioned, and that pondering or brooding look which made him old had been upon him like a heavy cloud ever since. As he passed out, the jury, who had turned back and paused a moment, spoke through their foreman. They were not agreed and wished to retire. Mr. Lorry, who had gone out when the young lady and her father went out, now reappeared and beckoned to Jerry, who, in the slackened interest, could easily get near him. Jerry, if you wish to take something to eat, you can, but keep in the way. You will be sure to hear when the jury come in, and don't be a moment behind them, for I want you to take the verdict back to the bank. You are the quickest messenger I know, and will get to Temple Bar long before I can. An hour and a half limped heavily away in the thief and rascal crowded passages below, even though assisted off with mutton pies and ale. The horse messenger, uncomfortably seated on a form after taking that refection, had dropped into a doze, when a loud murmur and a rapid tide of people setting up the stairs that led to the court carried him along with them. Jerry! Jerry! Mr. Lorry was already calling at the door when he got there. Yes, sir. It's a fight to get back. Here I am, sir. Mr. Lorry handed him a paper through the throng. Quick, have you got it? Yes, uh, sir. Hastily written on the paper was the word, acquitted. From the dimly lighted passages of the court, the last sediment of the human stew that had been boiling there all day was straining off. When Dr. Manette, Lucy Manette, his daughter, Mr. Lorry, the solicitor for the defence, and its counsel, Mr. Stryver, stood gathered round Mr. Charles Darnay, just released, congratulating him on his escape from death. Mr. Darnay kissed Miss Manette's hand fervently and gratefully, and turned to Mr. Stryver, whom he warmly thanked. The friends of the acquitted prisoner then dispersed. Another person, who had not joined the group, or interchanged a word with any one of them, now stepped up and turned to Darnay. This is a strange chance that throws you and me together. This must be a strange night to you, standing alone here with your counterpart on these street stones, said Carton. Nobody had made any acknowledgement of Mr. Carton's part in the day's proceedings. Nobody had known of it. I hardly seem yet returned Charles Darnay to belong to this world again. I don't wonder at it. It's not so long since you were pretty far advanced on your way to another. You speak faintly. I begin to think I am faint. And why the devil don't you dine? I dine myself while those numbskulls were deliberating which world you should belong to, this or some other. Let me show you the nearest tavern to dine, Weller. Drawing his arm through his own, Sidney Carton took him down Ludgate Hill to Fleet Street, and so up a covered way into a tavern. Here they were shown into a little room, where Charles Darnay was soon recruiting his strength with a good plain dinner and good wine. While Carton sat opposite to him at the same table, with his separate bottle of port before him, and his fully half-insolent manner upon him. Well, now your dinner is done, Carton presently said, why don't you call a health, Mr. Darnay? Why don't you give a toast? What health? What toast? Why, it's on the tip of your tongue. It ought to be. It must be. I'll swear it's there. 
Miss Manette, then. Miss Manette, then. Looking his companion full in the face while he drank the toast, Carton flung his glass over his shoulder against the wall, where it shivered to pieces. That's a fair lady to be pitied by and wept for by. How does it feel, eh? It's worth being tried for one's life to be the object of such sympathy and compassion, Mr. Darnay. Darnay answered not a word. Mr. Darnay, let me ask you a question. Willingly. Do you think I particularly like you? Oh, really, Mr. Carton, returned the other, oddly disconcerted. I have not asked myself the question. Yeah, but ask yourself the question now. You have acted as if you do, but I don't think you do. I don't think I do, said Carton. I begin to have a very good opinion of your understanding. Nevertheless, pursued Darnay, rising to ring the bell, there is nothing in that, I hope, to prevent my calling the reckoning, and our parting without ill blood on either side. The bill being paid, Charles Darnay rose and wished him good night. Without returning the wish, Carton rose too, with something of a threat of defiance in his manner, and said, A last word, Mr. Darnay. You think I am drunk? I think you have been drinking, Mr. Carton. Think? You know I've been drinking. Well, since I must say so, I know it. And then you shall likewise know why. I am a disappointed drudge, sir. I care for no man on earth, and no man on earth cares for me. Much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better. Maybe so, Mr. Darnay, maybe not. Don't let your sober face elate you, however. You don't know what it may come to. Good night. When he was left alone, the strange being took up a candle and went to a glass that hung upon the wall. Do you particularly like the man he muttered at his own image? Why should you particularly like a man who resembles you? There is nothing in you to like. You know that. Change places with him. Would you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was? Come on. Have it out in plain words. You hate the fellow. He resorted to a pint of wine for consolation, drank it all in a few minutes and fell asleep on his arms, with his hair straggling over the table, and a long winding sheet in the candle dripping down upon him. The quiet lodgings of Dr. Manette were in a quiet street corner not far from Soho Square. On the afternoon of a certain fine Sunday, when the waves of four months had rolled over the trial for treason, and carried it as to the public interest and memory far out to sea. Mr. Jarvis Lorry walked along the sunny streets from Clerkenwell, where he lived, on his way to dine with the doctor. After several relapses into business absorption, Mr. Lorry had become the doctor's friend, and the quiet street corner was the sunny part of his life. Dr. Manette received such patients here as his old reputation and its revival in the floating whispers of his story brought him. His scientific knowledge and his vigilance and skill in conducting ingenious experiments brought him otherwise into moderate request, and he earned as much as he wanted. These things were within Mr. Jarvis Lorry's knowledge, thoughts and notice when he rang the doorbell of the tranquil house in the corner on the fine Sunday afternoon. Dr. Manette at home? Expected home. Miss Lucy at home? Expected home. Miss Pross at home? Possibly at home, but of a certainty impossible for a handmaid to anticipate intentions of Miss Pross as to admission or denial of the fact. Well, as I am at home myself, said Mr. Lorry, I'll go upstairs. There were three rooms on the floor. The first was the best room, and in it were Lucy's birds and flowers and books and desk and work table and a box of watercolours. The second was the doctor's consulting room, used also as the dining room. The third changingly speckled by the rustle of the plain tree in the yard was the doctor's bedroom and there in a corner stood the disused shoemaker's bench and tray of tools much as it had stood on the fifth floor of the dismal house by the wine shop in the suburb of saint antoine in paris i wonder said mr lorry pausing in his looking about that he keeps that reminder of his sufferings about him and why wonder at that was the abrupt inquiry that made him start it proceeded from Miss Pross, the wild red woman, strong of hand, who 
whose acquaintance he had first made at the Royal George Hotel at Dover, and had since improved. As we happen to be alone for the moment, and are both people of business, Mr. Lorry said, let me ask you, does the doctor, in talking with Lucy, never refer to the shoemaking time yet? Never. And yet keeps that bench and those tools beside him? Ah, returned Miss Pross, shaking her head, but I don't say he don't refer to it within himself. Do you believe that he thinks of it much? I do, said Miss Pross. Do you imagine, Mr. Lorry had begun, when Miss Pross took him up short. Here they are, said she, rising to break up the conference. Miss Pross was a pleasant sight, albeit wild and red and grim, taking off her darling's bonnet when she came upstairs, and touching it up with the ends of her handkerchief, blowing the dust off it, and folding her mantle ready for laying by, and smoothing her rich hair with as much pride as she could possibly have taken in her own hair if she had been the vainest and handsomest of women. On Sundays, Miss Pross dined at the doctor's table, but on other days persisted in taking her meals at unknown periods, either in the lower regions or in her own room on the second floor. It was an oppressive day, and after dinner Lucy proposed that the wine should be carried out under the plane tree, and they should sit there in the air. Shortly, Mr. Darney presented himself while they were sitting under the plane tree. Dr. Manette received him kindly, and so did Lucy. But Miss Pross suddenly became afflicted with a twitching in the head and body, and retired into the house. She was not unfrequently the victim of this disorder, and she called it, in familiar conversation, a fit of the jerks. The doctor was in his best condition, and looked especially young. The resemblance between him and Lucy was very strong at such times, and as they sat side by side, she leaning on his shoulder, and he resting his arm on the back of her chair, it was very agreeable to trace the likeness. Tea time, and Miss Pross making tea with another fit of the jerks upon her since Mr. Carton had lounged in. The night was so very sultry that although they sat with doors and windows open, they were overpowered by heat. When the tea table was done with, they all moved to one of the windows and looked out into the heavy twilight. Lucy sat by her father, Darnay sat beside her, and Carton leaned against a window. The curtains were long and white, and some of the thunder gusts that whirled into the corner from the approaching storm caught them up to the ceiling and waved them like spectral wings. The raindrops are still falling, large, heavy, and few, said Dr. Manette. It comes slowly. It comes surely, said Carton. They spoke low as people watching and waiting mostly do, as people in a dark room watching and waiting for lightning always do. Monsignor, one of the great lords in power at the court, held his fortnightly reception in his grand hotel in Paris. Monsignor was in his inner room, his sanctuary of sanctuaries, his holiest of holiest to the crowd of worshippers in the suite of rooms without. Monsignor was about to take his chocolate. It took four men, all four ablaze with gorgeous decorations, to conduct the happy chocolate to Monsignor's lips. One lackey carried the chocolate pot into the sacred presence, a second milled and frothed the chocolate with the little instrument he bore for that function, a third presented the favoured napkin, a fourth poured the chocolate out. It was impossible for Monsignor to dispense with one of these attendants on the chocolate and hold his high place under the admiring heavens. It seemed that the leprosy of unreality disfigured every human creature in attendance upon Monsignor. But the comfort was that all the company at the Grand Hotel of Monsignor were perfectly dressed. If the Day of Judgment had only been ascertained to be a dress day, Everybody there would have been eternally correct. Dress was the one unfailing talisman and charm used for keeping all things in their places. Monsignor, having eased his four men of their burdens and taken his chocolate, caused the doors of the holiest of holiest to be thrown open and issued forth. Then, 
what submission, what cringing and fawning, what civility, what abject humiliation. Bestowing a word of promise here and a smile there, a whisper on one happy slave, and a wave of the hand on another, Monsignor affably passed through his rooms. The show being over, there was soon but one person left of all the crowd, and he, with his hat under his arm and his snuff-box in his hand, slowly passed among the mirrors on his way out. I devote you, said this person, stopping at the last door on his way and turning in the direction of the sanctuary, to the devil. With that, he shook the snuff from his fingers as if he had shaken the dust from his feet and quietly walked downstairs. He was a man of about sixty, handsomely dressed, haughty in manner, and with a face like a fine mask, a face of transparent paleness, every feature in it clearly defined, one set expression on it. The man went downstairs into the courtyard, got into his carriage, and drove away. Not many people had talked with him at the reception. He had stood in a little space apart, and Monseigneur might have been warmer in his manner. It appeared, under the circumstances, rather agreeable to him to see the common people dispersed before his horses, and often barely escaping from being run down. His man drove as if he were charging an enemy, and the furious recklessness of the man brought no check into the face or to the lips of the master. With a wild rattle and clatter, and an inhuman abandonment of consideration, not easy to be understood in these days, the carriage dashed through the streets and swept round corners, with women screaming before it, and men clutching each other and clutching children out of its way. At last, swooping at a street corner by a fountain, one of its wheels came to a sickening little jolt, and there was a loud cry from a number of voices, and the horses reared and plunged. But for the latter inconvenience, the carriage probably would not have stopped. Carriages were often known to drive on and leave their wounded behind, and why not? But the frightened valet had got down in a hurry, and there were twenty hands at the horses' bridles. What has gone wrong? said Monsieur, calmly looking out. A tall man in a nightcap had caught up a bundle from among the feet of the horses, and had laid it on the base of the fountain, and was down in the mud and wet, howling over it like a wild animal. Pardon, Monsieur le Marquis, said a ragged and submissive man. It is a child. Why does he make that abominable noise? Is it his child? Excuse me, Monsieur le Marquis. It is a pity, yes. Monsieur the Marquis took out his purse. It is extraordinary to me, said he, that you people cannot take care of yourselves and your children. One or the other of you is forever in the way. How do I know what injury you have done my horses? See, give him that. He threw out a gold coin for the valet to pick up, and all the heads craned forward that all the eyes might look down at it as it fell. The tall man called out again with a most unearthly cry. Dead. Without deigning to look at the assemblage a second time, Monsieur the Marquis leaned back in his seat and was just being driven away with the air of a gentleman who had accidentally broken some common thing and had paid for it, and could afford to pay for it, when his ease was suddenly disturbed by a coin flying into his carriage and ringing on its floor. Hold, said Monsieur the Marquis. Hold the horses. Who threw that? You dog, said the Marquis. I would ride over any one of you, very willingly, and exterminate you from the earth. If I knew which rascal threw at the carriage... And if that brigand were sufficiently near it, he should be crushed under the wheels. So cowed was their condition, and so long and hard their experience of what such a man could do to them, within the law and beyond it, that not a voice or a hand or even an eye was raised. Among the men, not one. But one woman, who stood knitting, looked up steadily, and looked the Marquis in the face. It was not for his dignity to notice it. His contemptuous eyes passed over her, and over all the other rats, and he leaned back in his seat again and gave the word, Go on. It was a heavy mass of building, that chateau of Monsieur the Marquis, the large stone courtyard before it, and two stone sweeps of staircase meeting in a stone terrace before the principal door. 
a stony business altogether, with heavy stone balustrades and stone urns and stone flowers and stone faces of men and stone heads of lions in all directions, as if the Gorgon's head had surveyed it when it was finished two centuries ago. The great door clanged behind him, and Monsieur the Marquis crossed a hall grim with certain old boar spears, swords and knives of the chase, Grimmer with certain heavy riding rods and riding whips, of which many a peasant gone to his benefactor death had felt the weight when his lord was angry. My nephew, Monsieur Charles, whom I expect, is he arrived from England? Monseigneur, not yet, a humble voice replied. Ah, it is not probable he will arrive tonight. Nevertheless, leave the table as it is. I shall be ready in a quarter of an hour. In a quarter of an hour, the Marquis was ready and sat down alone to his sumptuous and choice supper. He was halfway through it when he again stopped with his glass in his hand, hearing the sound of wheels. It came on briskly, and came up to the front of the chateau. Ask who is arrived? It was his nephew. He was to be told, said the Marquis, that supper awaited him then and there, and that he was prayed to come to it. And in a little while he came. He had been known in England as Charles Darnay. The Marquis received him in a courtly manner, but they did not shake hands. "'You left Paris yesterday, sir,' he said to the Marquis as he took his seat at the table. "'Yesterday. And you?' "'I come direct.' "'From London?' "'Yes.' "'You have been a long time coming,' said the Marquis with a smile. "'On the contrary, I come direct.' "'Pardon me, I mean not a long time on the journey, a long time intending the journey.' I have been detained by... The nephew stopped a moment in his answer. Various business. Without doubt, said the polished uncle. So long as a servant was present, no other words passed between them. When coffee had been served and they were alone together, the nephew, looking at the uncle and meeting the eyes of the face that was like a fine mask, opened a conversation. There is not, he said... A face I can look at in all this country round about us, which looks at me with any deference on it, but the dark deference of fear and slavery. A compliment, said the Marquis, to the grandeur of the family, merited by the manner in which the family has sustained its grandeur. Repression is the only lasting philosophy. The dark deference of fear and slavery, my friend, observed the Marquis, will keep the dogs obedient to the whip as long as this roof shuts out the sky. Meanwhile, continued the Marquis, I will preserve the honour and repose of the family, if you will not. But you must be fatigued. Shall we terminate our conference for the night? A moment more. An hour, if you please. Sir, said the nephew, we have done wrong, and are reaping the fruits of wrong. We have done wrong, repeated the Marquis with an inquiring smile, and delicately pointing first to his nephew, then to himself. Our family, continued Charles, our honourable family, whose honour is of so much account to both of us in such different ways. Even in my father's time we did a world of wrong, injuring every human creature who came between us and our pleasure, whatever it was. Why need I speak of my father's time when it is equally yours? Can I separate my father's twin brother, joint inheritor and next successor from himself? Death has done that, said the Marquis, and has left me, answered the nephew, bound to a system that is frightful to me. This property and France are lost to me. I renounce them. Forgive my curiosity, said the uncle. Do you, under your new philosophy, graciously intend to live? I must do to live what others of my countrymen, even with nobility at their backs, may have to do some day. Work. In England, for example? Yes. The family honour, sir, is safe for me in this country. The family name can suffer from me in no other, for I bear it in no other. "'England is very attractive to you, seeing how indifferently you have prospered there,' observed the Marquis, turning his calm face to his nephew with a smile. "'Good night. I look to the pleasure of seeing you again in the morning. Good repose.' 
light monsieur my nephew to his chamber there and burn monsieur my nephew in his bed if you will he added to himself before he rang his little bell again and summoned his valet to his own bedroom for several heavy hours the stone faces of the chateau lion and human stared blindly at the night the fountain in the village flowed unseen and unheard and the fountain at the chateau dropped unseen and unheard and then the gray water of both began to be ghostly in the light and the eyes of the stone faces of the chateau were opened lighter and lighter until at last the sun touched the tops of the still trees and poured its radiance over the hill now the sun was full up and movement began in the village casement windows opened crazy doors were unbarred and people came forth shivering chilled as yet by the new sweet air these trivial incidents belonged to the routine of life the return of morning surely not so the ringing of the great bell of the chateau nor the running up and down the stairs nor the hurried figures on the terrace nor the booting and tramping here and there and everywhere nor the quick saddling of horses and riding away what did all this portend and what portended the swift hoisting up of monsieur gabel who was the postmaster and tax collector of the town behind a servant on horseback and the conveying away of the said gabel double laden though the horse was at a gallop it portended that there was one stone face too many up at the chateau the gorgon had surveyed the building again in the night and had added the one stone face wanting the stone face for which it had waited through about 200 years it lay back on the pillow of monsieur the marquis it was like a fine mask suddenly startled made angry and petrified driven home into the heart of the stone figure attached to it was a knife round its hilt was a frill of paper on which was scrawled drive him fast to his tomb this from jack more months to the number of 12 had come and gone and mr charles darnay was established in england as a higher teacher of the french language who was conversant with french literature he had loved lucy manette from the hour of his danger he had never heard a sound so sweet and dear as the sound of her compassionate voice he had never seen a face so tenderly beautiful as hers was when it was confronted with his own on the edge of the grave that had been dug for him but he had not yet spoken to her on the subject the assassination at the deserted chateau far away beyond the heaving water and the long long dusty roads the solid stone chateau which had itself become the mere mist of a dream had been done a year and he had never yet by so much as a single spoken word disclosed to her the state of his heart that he had his reasons for this he knew full well it was again a summer day when lately arrived in london from his college occupation he turned into the quiet corner in soho bent on seeking an opportunity of opening his mind to dr manette it was the close of the summer day and he knew lucy to be out with miss pross he found the doctor reading in his armchair at a window charles dunne i rejoice to see you we have been counting on your return these three or four days past Mr Striver and Sidney Carton were both here yesterday and both made you out to be more than you I'm obliged to them for their interest in the matter he answered a little coldly as to them though very warmly as to the doctor uh, Miss Manette is well said the doctor as he stopped short and your return will delight us all she has gone out on some household matters and will soon be home uh, Dr Manette I knew she was from home. I took the opportunity of her being from home to beg to speak to you. Is Lucy the topic? She is. It is hard for me to speak of her at any time. It is very hard for me to hear her spoken of in that tone of yours, Charles Dunne. It is a tone of fervent admiration, true homage and deep love, Dr. Manette, he said deferentially. Have you spoken to Lucy? No. Not written. 
Never. It would be ungenerous to affect not to know that your self-denial is to be referred to your consideration for her father. Her father thanks you. He offered his hand, but his eyes did not go with it. I know, said Danny respectfully. How can I fail to know, Dr. Minette? I, who have seen you together from day to day, that between you and Miss Minette there is an affection so unusual, so touching, so belonging to the circumstances in which it has been nurtured, and that it can have few parallels even in the tenderness between a father and child. You speak so feelingly and so manfully, Charles Darnay, that I thank you with all my heart, and will open all my heart on nearly so. Have you any reason to believe that Lucy loves you? None, as yet none. Is it the immediate object of this confidence that you may at once ascertain that with my knowledge? Not even so. I might not have the hopefulness to do it for weeks. I might, mistaken or not mistaken, have that hopefulness tomorrow. Do you seek any guidance from me? May I ask, sir, if you think she is... As he hesitated, her father supplied the rest. Is she sought by any other suitor? It is what I meant to say. Her father considered a little before he answered, You have seen Mr. Carton here yourself. Mr. Stryver is here too, occasionally. If it be at all, it can only be one of these. Or both, said Danny. Then he continued, Your confidence in me ought to be returned with full confidence on my part. My present name, though but slightly changed from my mother's, is not, as you will remember, my own. I wish to tell you what it is, and why I am in England. Stop, said the doctor of Beauvais. I wish it that I may the better deserve your confidence, and have no secret from you. Stop! For an instant the doctor even had his two hands at his ears. For another instant even had his two hands laid on Danny's lips. Tell me when I ask you, not now. If your suit should prosper, if Lucy should love you, you shall tell me on your marriage morning. Do you promise? Willingly. Give me your hand. She will be home directly, and it is better she should not see us together tonight. Go. God bless you. If Sidney Carton ever shone anywhere, he certainly never shone in the house of Dr. Manette. He had been there often during a whole year, and had always been the same moody and morose lounger there. However, on a day in August, his feet became animated by an intention, and in the working out of that intention, they took him to the doctor's door. He was shown upstairs and found Lucy at her work alone. She had never been quite at her ease with him, and received him with some little embarrassment as he seated himself near her table. But looking up at his face, in the interchange of the first few commonplaces, she observed a change in it. I fear you are not well, Mr. Carton. No, but the life I lead, Miss Manette, is not conducive to health. What is to be expected of or by such profligates, hmm? Is it not... Oh, forgive me. I have begun the question on my lips. A pity to live no better life. Well, God knows it is a shame. Then why not change it? Looking gently at him again, she was surprised and saddened to see that there were tears in his eyes. There were tears in his voice, too, as he answered. It, it is too late for that. I shall never be better than I am. I shall sink lower and be worse. <clears throat> oh, pray forgive me, Miss Manette. I break down before the knowledge of what I am about to say to you. Will you hear me? If it will do you any good, Mr. Carton, if it would make you any happier, it would make me very glad. God bless you for your sweet compassion. He unshaded his face after a little while and spoke steadily. If it has been possible, Miss Manette, that you could have returned the love of the man that you see before you, so flung away... Wasted, drunken, poor creature of misuse as you know him to be. 
He would have been conscious this day and hour, in spite of his happiness, that he would bring you to misery, bring you to sorrow and repentance, blight you, disgrace you, pull you down with him. I know very well that you can have no tenderness for me. I ask for none. I am even thankful that it cannot be. Without it, can I not save you, Mr. Carton? Can I not recall you, forgive me again, to a better course? Can I in no way repay your confidence? I know this is a confidence, she modestly said after a little hesitation and in earnest tears. I know you would say this to no one else. Can I turn it to no good account for yourself, Mr. Carton? He shook his head. My last supplication of all is this. Try to hold me in your mind at some quiet times as ardent and sincere in this one thing. The time will come. The time will not be long in coming. When new ties will be formed about you, ties that will bind you yet more tenderly and strongly to the home you so adorn. The dearest ties that will ever grace and gladden you. Oh, Miss Manette, when the little picture of a happy father's face looks up in yours, when you see your own bright beauty springing up anew at your feet, think now and then that there is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. He said farewell, said, alas, God bless you, and left her. Never did the sun go down with a brighter glory on the quiet corner in Soho than one memorable evening when the doctor and his daughter sat under the plane tree together. Never did the moon rise with a milder radiance over Great London than on that night when it found them still seated under the tree and shone upon their faces through its leaves. Lucy was to be married tomorrow. She had reserved this last evening for her father, and they sat alone under the plane tree. You are happy, my dear father. Quite, my child. They had said little, though they had been there a long time. When it was yet light enough to work and read, she had neither engaged herself in her usual work, nor had she read to him. She had employed herself in both ways at his side under the tree many and many a time. But this time was not quite like any other, and nothing could make it so. And I am very happy tonight, dear father. I'm deeply happy in the love that heaven has so blessed, my love for Charles and Charles's love for me. But if my life were not to be still consecrated to you, or if my marriage were so arranged as that it would part us, even by the length of a few of these streets, I should be more unhappy and self-reproachful now than I can tell you. He embraced her, solemnly commended her to heaven, and humbly thanked heaven for having bestowed her on him. By and by, they went into the house. There was no one bidden to the marriage but Mr. Lorry. There was even to be no bridesmaid but the gaunt Miss Pross. The marriage day was shining brightly, and they were ready outside the closed door of the doctor's room where he was speaking with Charles Darnay. They were ready to go to church. The beautiful bride, Mr. Lorry, and Miss Pross. The door of the doctor's room opened, and he came out with Charles Downer. He was so deadly pale, which had not been the case when they went in together, that no vestige of colour was to be seen in his face. But in the composure of his manner he was unaltered, except that to the shrewd glance of Mr. Lorry it disclosed some shadow indication that the old air of avoidance and dread had lately passed over him like a cold wind. He gave his arm to his daughter, and took her downstairs to the chariot which Mr. Lorry had hired in honour of the day. The rest followed in another carriage. Soon, in a neighbouring church, where no strange eyes looked on, Charles Darnay and Lucy Manette were happily married. When the newly married pair came home, the first person who appeared to offer his congratulations was Sidney Carton. He was not improved in habits, or in looks, or in manner 
but there was a certain rugged air of fidelity about him which was new to the observation of Charles Darnay. He watched his opportunity of taking Darnay aside into a window and of speaking to him when no one ever heard. Mr. Darnay, said Carton, I wish we might be friends. We are already friends, I hope. You are good enough to say so as a fashion of speech, but I don't mean any fashion of speech. Indeed, when I say I wish we might be friends, I scarcely mean quite that either. Charles Darnay, as was natural, asked him, in all good humour and good fellowship, what he did mean. Upon my life, said Carton, smiling, I find that easier to comprehend in my own mind than to convey to yours. Ah, but let me try. You remember a certain famous occasion when I was more drunk um, than, than usual? I remember a certain famous occasion when you forced me to confess that you had been drinking. Yes, I remember it too. The curse of those occasions is heavy upon me, for I always remember them. I hope it may be taken into account one day, when all days are at an end for me. Oh, don't be alarmed. I am not going to preach. I'm not at all alarmed. Earnestness in you is anything but alarming to me. Ah, said Carton, with a careless wave of his hand, as if he waved that away. On the drunken occasion in question, one of a large number, as you know, I was insufferable about liking you and not liking you. I wish you would forget it. I forgot it long ago. They shook hands upon it, and Sidney turned away. Within a minute, he was, to all outward appearance, as unsubstantial as ever. When he was gone, and in the course of an evening passed with Miss Pross, the doctor and Mr. Lorry, Charles Darnay made some mention of this conversation, in general terms, and spoke of Sidney Carton as a problem of carelessness and recklessness. He spoke of him, in short, not bitterly, or meaning to bear hard upon him, but as anybody might who saw him as he showed himself. He had no idea that this could dwell in the thoughts of his fair young wife, but when he afterwards joined her in their own rooms, he found her waiting for him, with the old pretty lifting of the forehead strongly marked. We are thoughtful tonight, said Darnay, drawing his arm about her. Yes, dearest Charles, with her hands on his breast and the inquiring and attentive expression fixed upon him. We are rather thoughtful tonight. We have something on our mind tonight. Oh, what is it, my Lucy? Will you promise not to press one question on me if I beg you not to ask it? Will I promise? What will I not promise to my love? What indeed? With his hand putting aside the golden hair from the cheek and his other hand against the heart that beat for him. I think, Charles, poor Mr. Carton deserves more consideration and respect than you expressed for him tonight. Indeed, my own wife, sir. That is what you are not to ask me. But I think, I know he does. And, oh, my dearest love, she urged, clinging nearer to him, laying her head upon his breast and raising her eyes to his, remember how strong we are in our happiness and how weak he is in his misery. The supplication touched him home. I will always remember it, dear heart. I will remember it as long as I live. Ever busily winding the golden thread which bound her husband and her father and herself and her old directress and companion in a life of quiet bliss, Lucy sat in the still house in the tranquilly resounding corner, listening to the echoing footsteps of years. Time passed, and her little Lucy lay on her bosom. Then, among the advancing echoes, there was the tread of her tiny feet and the sound of her prattling words. The shady house was sunny with a child's laugh, and the divine friend of children, to whom in her trouble she has confided hers, seemed to take her child in his arms, as he took the child of old and made it a sacred joy to her. Little Lucy, comically studious at the task of the morning, or dressing a doll at her mother's footstool, chattered in the tongues of the two cities that were blended in her life. The echoes rarely answered to the actual tread of Sidney Carton. Some half-dozen times a year at most, he claimed his privilege of coming in uninvited and would sit among them through the evening, as he had once done often. He never came there heated with wine. And one other thing regarding him was whispered in the echoes, 
which has been whispered by all true echoes for ages and ages. No man ever really loved a woman, lost her, and knew her with a blameless, though an unchanged mind, when she was a wife and a mother. But her children had a strange sympathy with him, an instinctive delicacy of pity for him. What fine hidden sensibilities are touched in such a case, no echoes tell. But it is so, and it was so here. Carton was the first stranger to whom little Lucy held out her chubby arms, and he kept his place with her as she grew. But there were other echoes from a distance that rumbled menacingly in the corner all through this space of time. And it was now about little Lucy's sixth birthday. They began to have an awful sound, as of a great storm in France with a dreadful sea rising. The Paris suburb of Saint Antoine had been that morning a vast dusky mass of scarecrows, heaving to and fro with frequent gleams of light above the billowy heads, where steel blades and bayonets shone in the sun. As a whirlpool of boiling waters has a centre point, so all this raging circled round Defarge's wine shop, and every human drop in the cauldron had a tendency to be sucked towards the vortex where Defarge himself, already begrimed with gunpowder and sweat, issued orders, issued arms, thrust this man back, dragged this man forward, disarmed one to arm another, laboured and strove in the thickest of the uproar. Keep near to me, Jacques Three, cried Defarge, and to you, Jacques One and Two, separate, and put yourselves at the head of as many of these patriots as you can. Where is my wife? Ah, well, here you see me, said Madame, composed as ever, but not knitting today. Madame's resolute right hand was occupied with an axe, in place of the usual softer implements, and in her girdle were a pistol and a cruel knife. Where do you go, my wife? I go, said Madame, with you at present. You shall see me at the head of women by and by. Come then, cried Defarge in a resounding voice. Patriots and friends, we are ready. The Bastille! With a roar that sounded as if all the breath in France had been shaped into the detested word, the living sea rose wave on wave, depth on depth, and overflowed the city to that point. Alarm bells ringing, drums beating, the sea raging and thundering on its new beach, the attack began. Deep ditches, double drawbridge, massive stone walls, eight great towers, cannon, muskets, fire and smoke. Through the fire and through the smoke, in the fire and in the smoke, for the sea cast him up against a cannon, and on the instant he became a cannoneer. Defarge of the wine shop worked like a manful soldier two fierce hours. A white flag from within the fortress, and a parley. This dimly perceptible through the raging storm, nothing audible in it. Suddenly the sea rose immeasurably wider and higher, and swept Defarge of the wine shop over the lower drawbridge, past the massive stone outer walls, in among the eight great towers, surrendered. So resistless was the force of the ocean bearing him on, that even to draw his breath or turn his head was as impracticable as if he had been struggling in the surf at the South Sea, until he was landed in the outer courtyard of the Bastille. There, against an angle of a wall, he made a struggle to look about him. Jacques III was nearly at his side. Madame Defarge, still heading some of her women, was visible in the inner distance, and her knife was in her hand. Everywhere was tumult, exultation, deafening and maniacal bewilderment, astounding noise, yet furious dumb show. The prisoners... The records, the secret cells, the instruments of torture, the prisoners. Of all these cries and ten thousand incoherencies, the prisoners was the cry most taken up by the sea that rushed in, as if there were an eternity of people as well as of time and space. The hour was come when Saint Antoine was to execute its horrible idea of hoisting up men for lamps, to show what it could be and do. Saint Antoine's blood was up, and the blood of tyranny and domination by the iron hand was down. Down on the steps of the Hotel de Ville, where the governor's body lay. Down on the sole of the shoe of Madame Defarge, where she had trodden on the body to steady it for mutilation. Lower the lamp yonder, cried Saint Antoine, after glaring round for a new means of death. Here is one of his soldiers to be left on guard. The swinging sentinel was posted, and the sea rushed on. 
There was a change on the village where the fountain fell. Far and wide lay a ruined country, yielding nothing but desolation. For scores of years gone by, Monsieur the Marquis had squeezed it and wrung it and had seldom graced it with his presence except for the pleasures of the chase. On one particular evening, when the village had taken its poor supper, it did not creep to bed as it usually did, but came out of doors again and remained there. A curious contagion of whispering was upon it, and also when it gathered together at the fountain in the dark, another curious contagion of looking expectantly at the sky in one direction only. Monsieur Cabel, chief functionary of the place, became uneasy went out on his housetop alone and looked in that direction too. Glanced down from behind his chimneys at the darkening faces by the fountain below and sent word to the sacristan who kept the keys of the church that there might be need to ring the tocsin by and by. The night deepened. The trees environing the old chateau, keeping its solitary state apart, moved in a rising wind as though they threatened the pile of building massive and dark in the gloom. Presently the shadow began to make itself strangely visible by some light of its own, as though it were glowing luminous. Then a flickering streak played behind the architecture of the front, picking out transparent places and showing where balustrades, arches and windows were. Then it soared higher and grew broader and brighter. Soon from a score of the great windows flames burst forth and the stone faces awakened, stared out of the fire. The chateau was left to itself to flame and burn. In the roaring and raging of the conflagration, a red-hot wind driving straight from the infernal regions seemed to be blowing the edifice away. With the rising and falling of the blaze, the stone faces showed as if they were in torment. The village, light-headed with famine, fire and bell-ringing, and bethinking itself that Monsieur Gabel had to do with the collection of rent and taxes, though it was but a small instalment of taxes and no rent at all that Gabel had got in those latter days, became impatient for an interview with him, and surrounding his house summoned him to come forth for personal conference. Whereupon Monsieur Gabel did heavily bar his door and retire to hold counsel with himself. Probably Monsieur Gabel passed a long night up there, with a distant chateau for fire and candle, and the beating at his door combined with the joy ringing for music. The friendly dawn appeared at last, and as the rush candles of the village gutted out, the people happily dispersed. Monsieur Gabel came down, bringing his life with him for that while. Within a hundred miles, and in the light of other fires, there were other functionaries less fortunate, that night and other nights whom the rising sun found hanging across once peaceful streets where they had been born and bred. In such risings of fire and risings of sea, the firm earth shaken by the rushes of an angry ocean which had now no ebb, but was always on the flow higher and higher to the terror and wonder of the beholders on the shore, three years of tempest were consumed. Three more birthdays of little Lucy had been woven by the golden thread into the peaceful tissue of the life of her home. On a steaming misty afternoon, in the August of the year 1792, Mr. Lorry sat at his desk at Tilson's bank, and Charles Darnay stood leaning on it, talking with him in a low voice. It was within half an hour or so of the time of closing. But although you are the youngest man that ever lived, said Charles Darnay, rather hesitating, I must still suggest to you, I understand that I am too old, said Mr. Lorry. Well, unsettled weather, a long journey, uncertain means of travelling, a disorganised country, a city that may not be safe even for you. My dear Charles, said Mr Lorry, with a cheerful confidence, it is safe enough for me. Nobody will care to interfere with an old fellow of hard upon fourscore, when there are so many people there, much better worth interfering with. Mm, I wish I were going myself, said Charles Dunney, somewhat restlessly, and like one thinking aloud. Indeed. You're a pretty fellow to object and advise, exclaimed Mr. Lorry. You wish you were going yourself? Are you a Frenchman born? <laughs> you are a wise counsellor. However, I am not going, said Charles Darnay with a smile. 
It is more to the purpose that you say you are. And I am in plain reality. The truth is, my dear Charles, you can have no conception of the difficulty with which our business is transacted and of the peril in which our books and papers in Paris are involved. And do you really go tonight? I really go tonight, for the case has become too pressing to admit of delay. And do you take no one with you? All sorts of people have been proposed to me, but I will have nothing to say to any of them. I intend to take Jerry. Jerry has been my bodyguard on Sunday nights for a long time past, and I am used to him. Nobody will suspect Jerry of being anything but an English bulldog, or of having any design in his head but to fly at anybody who touches his master. I must say that I heartily admire your gallantry and youthfulness. I must say again, nonsense, nonsense. When I have executed this little commission, I shall perhaps accept Telson's proposal to retire and live at my ease. Time enough, then, to think about growing old. <clears throat> at that moment, a messenger approached Mr. Lorry, and laying a soiled and unopened letter before him, asked if he had yet discovered any traces of the person to whom it was addressed. The messenger laid the letter down so close to Darnay that he saw the direction, the more quickly because it was his own right name. The address, turned into English, ran, very pressing, to Monsieur Heretofore the Marquis saint Evremond of France, confided to the cares of Mrs. Telson and Company, Bankers, London, England. On the marriage morning, Dr. Manette had made it his one urgent and express request to Charles Darnay that the secret of this name should be, unless he, the doctor, dissolved the obligation, kept inviolate between them. Nobody else knew it to be his name. His own wife had no suspicion of the fact. Mr. Lorry could have none. No, said Mr. Lorry, in reply to the messenger. I have referred it, I think, to everybody now here, and no one can tell me where this gentleman is to be found. Danny, unable to restrain himself any longer, said, I, I know the fellow. Will you take charge of the letter, said Mr. Lorry? You know where to deliver it? I do. Will you undertake to explain that we suppose it to have been addressed here on the chance of our knowing where to forward it, and that it has been here some time? I will do so. Do you start for Paris from here? From here at eight. I will come back to see you off. Very ill at ease with himself, Dane made the best of his way into the quiet of the temple, opened the letter and read it. These were its contents. Prison of the Abbe, Paris, June the 21st, 1792. Monsieur Hertufort the Marquis. After having long been in danger of my life at the hands of the village, I have been seized with great violence and indignity. The crime for which I am imprisoned, Monsieur Hertufort the Marquis, and for which I shall be summoned before the tribunal and shall lose my life without your so generous help, is, they tell me, treason against the majesty of the people, in that I have acted against them for an emigrant. Ah, most gracious Monsieur Heretofore the Marquis, where is that emigrant? I cry in my sleep, where is he? I demand of heaven, will he not come to deliver me? No answer. Monsieur Heretofore the Marquis, I send my desolate cry across the sea, hoping it may perhaps reach your ears through the great bank of Telson known at Paris. For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honour of your noble name, I supplicate you, Monsieur Heretofore the Marquis, to succour and release me. Your afflicted Gabel. The latent uneasiness in Danny's mind was roused to vigorous life by this letter. The peril of an old servant and a good one, whose only crime was fidelity to himself and his family, stared him so reproachfully in the face that as he walked to and fro in the temple, considering what to do, he almost hid his face from the passers-by. Monsieur Gabel had held the impoverished and involved estate on written instructions to spare the people, to give them what little there was to give, such fuel as the heavy creditors would let them have in the winter, and such produce as could be saved from the same grip in the summer. And no doubt he had put the fact in plea and proof for his own safety, so that it could but not appear now. This favoured the desperate resolution Charles Downey had begun to make, that he would go to Paris. That night, 
It was the 14th of August. He sat up late and wrote two fervent letters. One was to Lucy, explaining the strong obligation he was under to go to Paris, and showing her at length the reasons that he had for feeling confident that he would become involved in no personal danger there. The other was to the doctor, confiding Lucy and their dear child to his care, and dwelling on the same topics with the strongest assurances. To both he wrote that he would dispatch letters in proof of his safety immediately after his arrival. The unseen force was drawing him fast to itself now, and all the tides and winds were sitting straight and strong towards it. He left his two letters with a trusty porter, to be delivered half an hour before midnight, and no sooner. Took horse for Dover, and began his journey. For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honour of your noble name, was the poor prisoner's cry, with which he strengthened his sinking heart, as he left all that was dear on earth behind him. The traveller fared slowly on his way, who fared towards Paris from England in the autumn of the year 1792. More than enough of bad roads, bad equipages and bad horses he would have encountered to delay him, though the fallen and unfortunate King of France had been upon his throne in all his glory. But the changed times were fought with other obstacles than these. Every town gate and village taxing house had its own band of citizen patriots with their national muskets in a most explosive state of readiness, who stopped all comers and goers, cross-questioned them, inspected their papers, looked for their names in lists of their own, turned them back, or sent them on, or stopped them and laid them in hold, as their capricious judgment or fancy deemed best for the dawning of the Republic, one and indivisible, of liberty equality, fraternity, or death. A very few French leagues of his journey were accomplished when Charles Darnay began to perceive that whatever might befall now, he must on to his journey's end. Not a mean village closed upon him, not a common barrier dropped across the road behind him, but he knew it to be another iron door in the series that was barred between him and England. The universal watchfulness so encompassed him that if he had been taken in a net or being forwarded to his destination in a cage, he could not have felt his freedom more completely gone. Nothing but the production of the afflicted Gabelle's letter from his prison of the Abbey would have got him on so far. His difficulty at the guardhouse in this small place had been such that he felt his journey to have come to a crisis, and he was therefore as little surprised as a man could be to find himself awakened at the small inn to which he had been remitted until morning, in the middle of the night. Awakened by a timid local functionary and three armed patriots in rough red caps and with pipes in their mouths, who sat down on the bed. Emigrant, said the functionary, I am going to send you on to Paris under an escort. Citizen, replied Danny, I desire nothing more than to get to Paris, though I could dispense with the escort. Silence! growled a red cap, striking at the coverlet with the butt end of his musket. Peace, aristocrat. It is as the good patriot says, observed the timid functionary. You are an aristocrat and, and must have an escort and must pay for it. I have no choice, said Charles Dunner. Choice? Listen to him, cried the same scowling red cap, as if it was not a favour to be protected from the lamp iron. It is always as the good patriot says, observed the functionary. Rise and dress yourself, emigrant. Darnay complied and was taken back to the guardhouse, where other patriots in rough red caps were smoking, drinking and sleeping by a watch fire. Here he paid a heavy price for his escort, and hence he started with it on the wet, wet roads at three o'clock in the morning. They travelled a day and a night before daylight at last found them before the wall of Paris. The barry was closed and strongly guarded when they rode up to it. Where are the papers of this prisoner? demanded a resolute-looking man in authority, who was summoned out by the guard. A numerous medley of men and women, not to mention beasts and vehicles of various sorts, was waiting to issue forth. But the previous identification was so strict that they filtered through the barrier very slowly. When he had sat in his saddle some half-hour, Downey found himself confronted by the same man in authority 
who directed the guard to open the barrier. Then he delivered to the escort, drunk and sober, a receipt for the escorted, and requested him to dismount. He did so, and the two patriots, leading his tired horse, turned and rode away without entering the city. He accompanied his conductor into a guardroom, smelling of common wine and tobacco, where certain soldiers and patriots asleep and awake, drunk and sober, were standing and lying about. Some registers were lying open on a desk, and an officer of a coarse, dark aspect presided over these. Citizen Defarge, said he to Darnay's conductor, as he took a slip of paper to write on. Is this the emigrant Evremonde, the Marquis Saint Evremonde? This is our man. You are consigned, Evremonde, to the prison of La Force. Just heaven, exclaimed Darnay. Under what law? And for what offence? The officer looked up from his slip of paper for a moment. We have new laws, Evremonde, and new offences since you were here. He said it with a hard smile. Defarge motioned to the prisoner that he must accompany him. The prisoner obeyed, and a guard of two armed patriots attended them. Is it you, said Defarge in a low voice, as he went down the guardhouse steps and turned into Paris, who married the daughter of Dr. Manette, once a prisoner in the Bastille that is no more? Yes, replied Darnay, looking at him with surprise. My name is Defarge, and I keep a wine shop in the Quartier Saint Antoine. Possibly you have heard of me. My wife came to your house to reclaim her father. Yes. The word wife seemed to serve as a gloomy reminder to Defarge to say with sudden impatience, in the name of that sharp female newly born and called La Guillotine, why did you come to France? In answer to the appeal of a fellow countryman, do you not believe it is the truth? Defarge glanced darkly at him for answer and walked on in a steady, set silence. The deeper he sank into this silence, the fainter hope there was, or so Darnay thought, of his softening in any slight degree. He therefore made haste to say, It is of the utmost importance to me. You know, citizen, even better than I of how much importance that I should be able to communicate to Mr. Lorry of Telson's Bank, an English gentleman who is now in Paris, the simple fact, without comment, that I have been thrown into the prison of La Force. Will you cause this to be done for me? I will do, Defarge doggedly rejoined, nothing for you. My duty is to my country and the people. I am the sworn servant of both against you. I will do nothing for you. The prison of La Force was a gloomy prison, dark and filthy with a horrible smell of foul sleep in it. Extraordinary how soon the noisome flavour of imprisoned sleep becomes manifest in all such places that are ill cared for. Through the dismal prison twilight, Darnay was taken by corridor and staircase, many doors clanging and locking behind them, until they came into a large, low, vaulted chamber, crowded with prisoners of both sexes. There was a murmur of commiseration as Charles Darnay crossed the room to a grated door where the jailer awaited him, and many voices, among which the soft and compassionate voices of women were conspicuous, gave him good wishes and encouragement. He turned at the grated door to render thanks of his heart. It closed under the jailer's hand, and the apparitions vanished from his sight forever. Telson's bank, established in the Saint-Germain quarter of Paris, was in a wing of a large house, approached by a courtyard and shut off from the street by a high wall and a strong gate. Mr. Jarvis Lorry sat by a newly lighted wood fire, and on his honest and courageous face there was a deeper shade than the pendant lamp could throw, or any object in the room distortedly reflect. A shade of horror. From the streets beyond the high wall and the strong gate there came the usual night hum of the city, with now and then an indescribable ring in it, weird and unearthly, as if some unwonted sounds of a terrible nature were going up to heaven. Thank God, said Mr. Lorry, clasping his hands, that no one near and dear to me is in this dreadful town tonight. May he have mercy on all who are in danger. Soon afterwards the bell at the great gate sounded. But there was no loud eruption into the courtyard as he had expected, and he heard the gate clash again, and all was quiet, 
until his door suddenly opened and two figures rushed in, at sight of which he fell back in amazement. Lucy and her father. What is this? cried Mr. Lorry, breathless and confused. What is the matter? Lucy, Manette, what has happened? What has brought you here? What is it? With a look fixed upon him in her paleness and wildness, she panted out in his arms imploringly, Oh, my dear friend, my husband. Your husband, Lucy? Charles. What of Charles? Here. Here? In Paris? He has been here some days, three or four. I don't know how many. I, I, I can't collect my thoughts. An errand of generosity brought him here, unknown to us. He was stopped at the barrier and, and sent to prison. The old man uttered an irrepressible cry. Almost at the same moment, the bell of the great gate rang again, and a loud noise of feet and voices came pouring into the courtyard. What is that noise? said the doctor, turning towards the window. Oh, don't look, cried Mr. Lorry. Oh, don't look out, Manette, for your life. Don't touch the blind. The doctor turned with his hand upon the fastening of the window and said with a cool, bold smile, oh, My dear friend, I have a charm life in this city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is no patriot in Paris, in Paris, in France, who, knowing me to have been a prisoner in the Bastille, would touch me, except to overwhelm me with embraces, or carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me a power that has brought us through the barrier, and gained us news of Charles there, and brought us here. He looked out upon a throng of men and women, not enough in number or near enough to fill the courtyard, not more than forty or fifty in all. The people in possession of the house had let them in at the gate, and they had rushed in to work at the grindstone. It had evidently been set up there for their purpose, as in a convenient and retired spot. But such awful workers, and such awful work. The grindstone had a double handle, and turning at it madly were two men whose faces, as their long hair flapped back when the whirlings of the grindstone brought their faces up, were more horrible and cruel than the visages of the wildest savages in their most barbarous disguise. False eyebrows and false moustaches were stuck upon them, and their hideous countenances were all bloody and sweaty, and all awry with howling, and all staring and glaring with beastly excitement and want of sleep. They are... Mr. Lorry whispered the words, glancing fearfully round at the locked room, murdering the prisoners. If you are sure of what you say, if you really have the power you think you have, as I believe you have, make yourself known to those devils and get taken to La Force. It may be too late, I don't know, but let it not be a minute later. Dr. Manette pressed his hand, hastened bareheaded out of the room, and was in the courtyard when Mr. Lorry regained the blind. His streaming white hair, his remarkable face, and the impetuous confidence of his manner as he put the weapons aside like water, carried him in an instant to the heart of the concourse at the stone. For a few moments there was a pause, and a hurry, and a murmur, and the unintelligible sound of his voice. And then Mr. Lorry saw him, surrounded by all, and in the midst of a line of twenty men long, all linked shoulder to shoulder and hand to shoulder, hurried out with the cries of, Live the Bastille prisoner! Help for the Bastille prisoners kindred in La Force! Room for the Bastille prisoner in front there! Save the prisoner every monde at La Force! And a thousand answering shots. He closed the lattice again with a fluttering heart, closed the window and the curtain, hastened to Lucy, and told her that her father was assisted by the people and gone in search of her husband. He found her child and Miss Pross with her, but it never occurred to him to be surprised by their appearance until a long time afterwards, when he sat watching them in such quiet as the night knew. Dr. Monette did not return until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. So much of what had happened in that dreadful time as could be kept from the knowledge of Lucy was so well concealed from her that not until long afterwards, when France and she were far apart, did she know that 1,100 defenceless prisoners of both sexes and all ages had been killed by the populace? That four days and nights had been darkened by this deed of horror? 
and that the air around her had been tainted by the slain. The doctor had tried hard, and never ceased trying to get Charles Darnay set at liberty, or at least to get him brought to trial. But the public current of the time set too strong and fast for him. The new era began. The king was tried, doomed, and beheaded. The Republic of Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death, declared for victory or death against the world in arms. The black flag waved night and day from the great towers of Notre Dame. One year and three months passed. And during all that time, Lucy was never sure from hour to hour but that the guillotine would strike off her husband's head next day. Every day through the stony streets, the tumbrils now jolted heavily, filled with condemned. Lovely girls, bright women, brown-haired, black-haired and grey, youths, stalwart men and old, gentle-born and peasant-born. All red wine for la guillotine, all daily brought into light from the dark cellars of the loathsome prisons, and carried to her through the street to slake her devouring thirst. Then, on a December day, her father imparted to Lucy the news, Charles is summoned for tomorrow. For tomorrow? There is no time to lose. I am well prepared, but there are precautions to be taken that could not be taken until he was actually summoned before the tribunal. He has not received a notice yet, but I know that he will be presently summoned for tomorrow and removed to the conciergerie. I have timely information. You are not afraid. She could scarcely answer. I trust in you. Do so implicitly. Your suspense is nearly ended, my darling. He shall be restored to you within a few hours. I have encompassed him with every protection. The dread tribunal of five judges, public prosecutor, and determined jury sat every day. Their lists went forth every evening and were read out by the jailers of the various prisons to their prisoners. The standard jailer joke was, come out and listen to the evening paper, you inside there. Charles Evremont called Darnay was at length arraigned. His judges sat upon the bench in feathered hats. With a rough red cap and tricolored cockade was the headdress otherwise prevailing. Looking at the jury and the turbulent audience, he might have thought that the usual order of things was reversed and that the felons were trying the honest men. Charles Evremond Cordane was accused by the public prosecutor as an emigrant whose life was forfeit to the Republic under the decree which banished all emigrants on pain of death. It was nothing that the decree bore date since his return to France. There he was, and there was the decree. He had been taken in France, and his head was demanded. Take off his head, cried the audience, an enemy to the Republic. The president rang his bell to silence those cries and asked the prisoner whether it was not true that he had lived many years in England. Undoubtedly it was. Was he not an emigrant then? What did he call himself? Not an emigrant, he hoped, within the sense and spirit of the law. Why not? The president desired to know. Because he had voluntarily relinquished a title that was distasteful to him. What proof had he of this? He handed in the names of two witnesses, Théophile Gabel and Alexandre Manette. But he had married in England, the president reminded him. True, but not an English woman. A citizeness of France? Yes, by birth. Her name and family? Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. This answer had a happy effect upon the audience. Cries in exultation of the well-known good physician rent the hall. On these few steps of his dangerous way, Charles Darnay had set his foot according to Dr. Manette's reiterated instructions. The same cautious counsel directed every step that lay before him and had prepared every inch of his road. At last the jury declared that they had heard enough, and that they were ready with their votes if the President were content to receive them. At every vote, the jurymen voted aloud and individually. The populace set up a shout of applause. All the voices were in the prisoner's favour, and the President declared him free. 
After grasping the doctor's hand as he stood victorious and proud before him, after grasping the hand of Mr. Lorry, after kissing little Lucy, who was lifted up to clasp her arms round his neck, and after embracing the ever-zealous and faithful pross who lifted her, Danny took his wife in his arms. Lucy, my own, I'm safe. Oh, dearest Charles, let me thank God for this on my knees, as I have prayed to him. They all reverently bowed their heads and hearts. When she was again in his arms, he said to her, And now speak to your father, dearest. No other man in all this France could have done what he has done for me. She laid her head upon her father's breast, as she had laid his poor head on her own breast long, long ago. He was happy in the return he had made her. He was recompensed for his suffering. He was proud of his strength. You must not be weak, my darling, he remonstrated. Don't tremble, sir. I have saved him. I have saved him. It was not another of the dreams in which he had often come back. He was really here. And yet his wife trembled, and a vague but heavy fear was upon her. All the air around was so thick and dark. The people were so passionately revengeful and fitful. The innocent were so constantly put to death on vague suspicion and black malice. It was so impossible to forget that many as blameless as her husband, and as dear to others as he was to her, every day shared the fate from which he had been clutched, that her heart could not be as lightened of its load as she felt it ought to be. The shadows of a wintry afternoon were beginning to fall, and even now the dreadful carts were rolling through the streets. Her mind pursued them, looking for him among the condemned, and then she clung closer to his real presence and trembled more. Her father, cheering her, showed a compassionate superiority to this woman's weakness, which was wonderful to see. No garret, no shoemaking, no 105 North Tower now. He had accomplished the task he had set himself. His promise was redeemed. He had saved Charles. Let them all lean upon him. The housekeeping was of a very frugal kind, not only because that was the safest way of life, involving the least offence to the people, but because they were not rich. Charles, throughout his imprisonment, had had to pay heavily for his bad food and for his guard and towards the living of the poorer prisoners. Partly on this account, and partly to avoid a domestic spy, they kept no servant. The citizen and citizeness who acted as porters at the courtyard gate rendered them occasional service, and Jerry, almost wholly transferred to them by Mr. Lorry, had become their daily retainer, and had his bed there every night. For some months past, Miss Pross and Jerry Cruncher had discharged the office of purveyors, the former carrying the money the latter the basket. Every afternoon, at about the time when the public lamps were lighted, they fared forth on this duty, and made and brought home such purchases as were needful. Now, Mr. Cruncher, said Miss Pross, whose eyes were red with felicity, if you are ready, I am. Jerry hoarsely professed himself at Miss Pross's service. Pray, pray be cautious, cried Lucy. Yes, 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 I'll be cautious, said Miss Pross. But may I ask a question, Dr. Manette, before I go? I think you may take that liberty, the doctor answered, smiling. Is there, asked the good woman, any prospect yet of our getting out of this place? I fear not yet. It would be dangerous for Charles yet. I ho am, said Miss Pross, cheerfully repressing a sigh as she glanced at her darling's golden hair in the light of the fire. Then we must have patience and wait. That's all. They went out, leaving Lucy and her husband, her father and the child, by a bright fire. All was subdued and quiet, and Lucy was more at ease than she had been. What is that? she cried all at once. Oh, my dear, said her father, stopping in his story and laying his hand on hers. Command yourself. What a disordered state you are in. The least thing, nothing startles you. You, your father's daughter... I thought my father, said Lucy, excusing herself with a pale face and in a faltering voice, 
that I heard strange feet upon the stairs. Oh, my love, the staircase is as still as death. As he said the word, a blow was struck upon the door. Oh, father, father, what can this be? Hide, Charles, save him. Oh, my child, said the doctor, rising and laying his hand upon her shoulder. I have saved him. What weakness is this, my dear? Let me go to the door. He took the lamp in his hand, crossed the two intervening outer rooms, and opened it. A rude clattering of feet over the floor, and four rough men in red caps, armed with sabres and pistols, entered the room. The citizen Evremont called Darnay, said the first. Who seeks him, answered Darnay. I seek him. We seek him. I know you, Evremont. I saw you before the tribunal. You are again the prisoner of the Republic. The four surrounded him where he stood with his wife and child clinging to him. Tell me how and why am I again a prisoner? It is enough that you return straight to the conciergerie and will know tomorrow. You are summoned for tomorrow. Happily unconscious of the new calamity at home, Miss Pross threaded her way along the narrow streets and crossed the river by the bridge of the Pont Neuf, reckoning in her mind the number of indispensable purchases she had to make. Jerry, with the basket, walked at her side. Having purchased a few small articles of grocery and a measure of oil for the lamp, Miss Pross bethought herself of the wine they wanted. After peeping into several wine shops, she stopped at the sign of the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, not far from the National Palace. As their wine was measuring out, a man parted from another man in a corner and rose to depart. In going, he had to face Miss Pross. No sooner did he face her than Miss Pross uttered a scream and clapped her hands. What is the matter? said the man who had caused Miss Pross to scream, speaking in a vexed, abrupt voice, though in a low tone, and in English. Oh, oh, Solomon, dear Solomon, cried Miss Pross, clapping her hands again. After not setting eyes upon you or hearing of you for so long a time, do I find you here? Don't call me Solomon. Do you want to be the death of me? Asked the man in a furtive, frightened way. A brother, brother, cried Miss Pross, bursting into tears. Have I ever been so hard with you that you ask me such a cruel question? Then hold your meddlesome tongue, said Solomon, and come out if you want to speak to me. Pay for your wine and come out. Who's this man? Miss Pross, shaking her loving and dejected head at her by no means affectionate brother, said through her tears, Mr. Cruncher. And let him come out too, said Solomon. Does he think me a ghost? Apparently Mr. Cruncher did, to judge from his looks. He said not a word, however, and Miss Pross, exploring the depths of her reticule through her tears with great difficulty, paid for her wine. If you expected me to be surprised, said her brother Solomon at the dark street corner, I am not surprised. I knew you were here, I know of most people who are here. If you really don't want to endanger my existence, which I half believe you do, go your ways as soon as possible and let me go mine. I am busy. I am an official. Mr. Cruncher then touched him on the shoulder and hoarsely and unexpectedly interposed with the following singular question. I say, might I ask a favour? As to whether your name is John Solomon or Solomon John. The official turned towards him with sudden distrust. He had not previously uttered a word. Come, said Mr. Cruncher. Speak out, you know. John Solomon or Solomon John. She calls you Solomon, and she must know, being your sister. And I know you're John, you know. Now, which of the two comes first, eh? And regarding that name of Pross, likewise. I want your name over the water. I'll swear it was a name of two syllables. Indeed? Yes. Tell the ones was one syllable. I know you. You was a spy witness at the Bailey. What in the name of father of lies own father to yourself was you called at that time? Bussad, said another voice striking in. Ah, that's her name for a thousand pounds, cried Jerry. The speaker who struck in was Sidney Carton. 
He had his hands behind him under the skirts of his riding coat, and he stood at Mr. Cruncher's elbow as negligently as he might have stood at the old bailey itself. Oh, don't be alarmed, my dear Miss Pross, he continued. I arrived at Mr. Lorry's to his surprise yesterday evening. We agreed that I would not present myself elsewhere until all was well, or unless I could be useful. I present myself here to beg a little talk with your brother. I wish you had a better employed brother than Mr. Barsad. I wish for your sake Mr. Barsad was not a sheep of the prisons. Sheep was a cant word of the time for a spy under the jailers. The spy, who was pale, turned paler, and asked him how he dared. I'll tell you, said Sidney. I lighted on you, Mr. Barsad, coming out of the prison of the conciergerie while I was contemplating the walls an hour or more ago. You have a face to be remembered, and I remember faces well. Could you favour me in confidence with some minutes of your company, at the office of Tilson's bank, for instance? Under a threat? Oh, did I say that? Then why should I go there? Really, Mr. Bassett, I can't say, if you can't. Do you mean that you won't say, sir? The spy irresolutely asked. You apprehend me very clearly, Mr. Barsad. I won't. Uh, I'll hear what you've got to say. Yes, I'll go with you. Mr. Lorry had just finished his dinner and was sitting before a cheery little log or two of fire. He turned his head as they entered and showed the surprise with which he saw a stranger. Miss Pross's brother, sir, said Sidney. Mr. Barsad. Barsad, repeated the old gentleman. Barsad? I have an association with the name, and with the face. I told you you had a remarkable face, Mr. Barsad, observed Carton coolly. Pray sit down. As he took a chair himself, he supplied the link that Mr. Lorry wanted, by saying to him with a frown, Witness at Darnay's trial at the Old Bailey. Mr. Lorry immediately remembered, and regarded his new visitor with an undisguised look of abhorrence. Mr. Barsad has been recognised by Miss Pross as her affectionate brother, said Sidney, and has acknowledged the relationship. I pass to worse news. Darnay has been arrested again. Struck with consternation, the old gentleman exclaimed, What do you tell me? I left him safe and free within these two hours, and am about to return to him. Arrested for all that. When was it done, Mr. Barsad? Just now if at all. Mr. Bassard is the best authority possible, sir, said Sidney, and I have it from Mr. Bassard's communication to a friend and brother sheep over a bottle of wine that the arrest has taken place. Now, said Sidney, this is a desperate time when desperate games are played for desperate stakes. No man's life here is worth purchase. Anyone carried home by the people today may be condemned tomorrow. And the stake I have resolved to play for in case of the worst, is a friend in the conciergerie. And the friend I purpose to myself to win is Mr. Barsad. <laughs> you need have good cards, sir, said the spy. I'll run them over and see what I hold. Mr. Barsad, he went on, in the tone of one who really was looking over a hand of cards. Sheep of the prisons, emissary of Republican committees, now turnkey, now prisoner, always spy and secret informer. So much the more valuable here for being English that an Englishman is less open to suspicion of subornation in those characters than a Frenchman. Represents himself to his employers under a false name. <laughs> That's a very good card. Mr. Bassard, now in the employ of the Republican French government, was formerly in the employ of the aristocratic English government, the enemy of France and freedom. Inference, clear as a day in this region of suspicion that Mr. Bassad, still in the pay of the aristocratic English government, is the spy of Pitt. <laughs> the treacherous foe of the Republic crouching in its bosom, the English traitor and agent of all mischief so much spoken of and so difficult to find. That's a card not to be beaten. Have you followed my hand, Mr. Bassett? With a countenance decidedly paler than before, the sheep of the prisons turned to Sidney Carton and said, It has come to a point. I go on duty soon. 
and can't overstay my time. You told me you had a proposal. What is it? Well, not very much. You are a turnkey at the conciergerie. Eh? I tell you once and for all, there is no such thing as an escape possible, said the spy firmly. Why need you tell me what I have not asked? You are a turnkey at the conciergerie. I am sometimes. You can be when you choose. I can pass in and out when I choose. Sidney Carton filled a glass with brandy, poured it slowly out upon the hearth, and watched it as it dropped. It being all spent, he said, rising, Come into the dark room here, and let us have one final word alone. It was ten o'clock at night when Sidney Carton stood before the prison of La Force. He stood in the middle of the street under a glimmering lamp and wrote with his pencil on a scrap of paper. Then, traversing with the decided step of one who remembered the way well, several dark and dirty streets, much dirtier than usual, for the best public thoroughfares remained uncleansed in those times of terror, he stopped at a chemist's shop, which the owner was closing with his own hands. A small, dim, crooked shop, kept in a tortuous, uphill thoroughfare, by a small, dim, crooked man. Giving the citizen good night as he confronted him at his counter, he laid the scrap of paper before him. The chemist whistled softly as he read it. Sidney Carton took no heed, and the chemist said, For you, citizen? For me. You will be careful to keep them separate, citizen. You know the consequences of mixing them. Perfectly. Certain small packets were made and given to him. He put them one by one in the breast of his inner coat, counted out the money for them, and deliberately left the shop. There is nothing more to do, said he, glancing upwards at the moon, until tomorrow. I can't sleep. The night wore out, and as he stood upon the bridge, listening to the water as it splashed the river walls of the island of Paris, where the picturesque confusion of houses and cathedral shone bright in the light of the moon. The day came coldly, looking like a dead face out of the sky. Then the night, with the moon and the stars, turned pale and died. And for a little while it seemed as if creation were delivered over to death's dominion. But the glorious sun, rising, seemed to strike those words, that burden of the night, straight and warm to his heart in its long bright rays. And looking along them with reverently shaded eyes, a bridge of light appeared to span the air between him and the sun, while the river sparkled under it. Mr. Lorry was already out when he got back, and it was easy to surmise where the good old man was gone. Sidney Carton drank nothing but a little coffee, ate some bread, and having washed and changed to refresh himself, went out to the place of trial. The court was all astir and a buzz when the black sheep, whom many fell away from in dread, pressed him into an obscure corner among the crowd. Mr. Lorry was there, and Dr. Manette was there. She was there, sitting beside her father. When her husband was brought in, she turned to look upon him, so sustaining, so encouraging, so full of admiring love and pitying tenderness, yet so courageous for his sake, that it called the healthy blood into his face, brightened his glance, and animated his heart. If there had been any eyes to notice the influence of her look on Sidney Carton, it would have been seen to be the same influence exactly. Before that unjust tribunal, there was little or no order of procedure, ensuring to any accused person any reasonable hearing. There could have been no such revolution if all laws, forms and ceremonies had not first been so monstrously abused that the suicidal vengeance of the revolution was to scatter them all to the winds. Every eye turned to the five judges and the public prosecutor. No favourable leaning in that quarter today. A fell, uncompromising, murderous business meaning there. Every eye then sought some other eye in the crowd and gleamed at it approvingly, and heads nodded at one another before bending forward with a strained attention. Charles Evremond, called Darnay, released yesterday, reaccused and retaken yesterday, 
Indictment delivered to him last night. Suspected and denounced enemy of the Republic. Aristocrat, one of a family of tyrants, one of a race prescribed for that they had used their abolished privileges to the infamous oppression of the people. Charles Evremond called Dane in right of such proscription, absolutely dead in law. At every juryman's vote, there was a roar, another and another, roar and roar. Unanimously voted, at heart and by descent, an aristocrat, an enemy of the Republic, a notorious oppressor of the people, back to the conciergerie and death within 24 hours. The wretched wife of the innocent man, thus doomed to die, fell under the sentence as if she had been mortally stricken. But she uttered no sound, and so strong was the voice within her, representing that it was she of all the world who must uphold him in his misery and not augment it, that it quickly raised her even from that shock. The judges having to take part in a public demonstration out of doors, the tribunal adjourned. The quick noise and movement of the courts emptying itself by many passengers had not ceased when Lucy stood stretching out her arms towards her husband, with nothing in her face but love and consolation. If I might touch him, if I might embrace him once, oh, good citizens, if you would have so much compassion for us. There was but a jailer left, along with two of the four men who had taken him last night, and Bassad. The people had all poured out to the show in the streets. Barsad proposed to the rest, let her embrace him then, it is but a moment. It was silently acquiesced in, and they passed her over the seats in the hall to a raised place where he, by leaning over the dock, could fold her in his arms. As he was drawn away, his wife released him and stood looking after him with her hands touching one another in the attitude of prayer and with a radiant look upon her face, in which there was even a comforting smile. As he went out at the prisoner's door, she turned, laid her head lovingly on her father's breast, tried to speak to him, and fell at his feet. Then, issuing from the obscure corner from which he had never moved, Sidney Carton came and took her up. Only her father and Mr. Lorry were with her. His arm trembled as it raised her and supported her head. Yet there was an air about him that was not all of pity, that had a flush of pride in it. Shall I take her to a coach? I shall never feel her weight. He carried her lightly to the door and laid her tenderly down in a coach. Her father and their old friend got into it, and he took his seat beside the driver. Before I go, Carton said, and paused, I may kiss her. It was remembered afterwards that when he bent down and touched her face with his lips, he murmured some words. The child who was nearest to him told them afterwards and told her grandchildren when she was a handsome old lady that she heard him say, A life you love. In the black prison of the conciergerie, the doomed of the day awaited their fate. They were in number as the weeks of the year. Fifty-two were to roll that afternoon on the life-tide of the city to the boundless everlasting sea. Before their cells were quit of them, new occupants were appointed. Before their blood ran into the blood spilled yesterday, the blood that was to mingle with theirs tomorrow was already set apart. Charles Darnay, alone in a cell, had sustained himself with no flattering delusion since he came to it from the tribunal. In every line of the narrative he had heard, he had heard his condemnation. When he lay down on his straw bed, he thought he had done with this world. But it beckoned him back in his sleep and showed itself in shining forms, free and happy, back in the old house in Soho, though it had nothing in it like the real house, unaccountably released and light of heart, he was with Lucy again, and she told him it was all a dream, and he had never gone away. A pause of forgetfulness, and then he had even suffered and had come back to her, 
dead and at peace, and yet there was no difference in him. Another pause of oblivion, and then he awoke in the sombre morning, unconscious where he was or what had happened, until it flashed upon his mind. This is the day of my death. The hours went on, and the clock struck the numbers he would never hear again. Nine gone forever. Ten gone forever. Eleven gone forever. Twelve coming on to pass away. Walking regularly to and fro with his arms folded on his breast, he heard one struck away from him without surprise. The hour had measured like most other hours. Devoutly thankful to heaven for his recovered self-possession, he thought. There is but another now, and turned to walk again. Footsteps in the stone passage outside the door. He stopped. The door was quickly opened and closed, and there stood before him face to face, quiet, intent upon him, with the light of a smile on his features and a cautionary finger on his lip. Sidney Carton. Of all the people upon earth you least expected to see me, he said. I could not believe it to be you. I can scarcely believe it. No, you are not... The apprehension came suddenly into his mind. A prisoner? No, I am accidentally possessed of a power over one of the keepers here, and in virtue of it I stand before you. I come here from her, your wife, dear Darnay. The prisoner wrung his hand. I bring you a request from her. What is it? A most earnest, pressing and emphatic entreaty, addressed to you in the most pathetic tones of the voice so dear to you, that you well remember. The prisoner turned his face partly aside. You have no time to ask me why I bring it, or what it means. I have no time to tell you. You must comply with it. Now take off those boots you wear, and draw on these of mine. Carton, there is no escaping from this place. It can never be done. You will only die with me. It is madness. It would be madness if I asked you to escape. But do I? When I ask you to pass out of that door, tell me it is madness and remain here. Now change that cravat for this one of mine, that coat for this of mine. While you do it, let me take this ribbon from your hair and shake out your hair like this of mine. With wonderful quickness and with a strength both of will and action that appeared quite supernatural, he forced all these changes upon him. The prisoner was like a young child in his hands. There are pen and ink and paper on this table, continued Carton. Is your hand steady enough to write? It was when you came in. I'll steady it again and write what I shall dictate. Now, quick, friend, quick! Pressing his hand to his bewildered head, Darnay sat down at the table. Carton, with his right hand in his breast, stood close beside him. Write exactly as I speak. To whom do I address it? To no one. Carton still had his hand in his breast. Do I date it? No. The prisoner looked up at each question, Carton standing over him with his hand in his breast, looking down. If you remember, said Carton, dictating, the words that passed between us long ago, you will readily comprehend this when you see it. You do remember them, I know. It is not in your nature to forget them. He was drawing his hand from his breast, the prisoner chancing to look up in his hurried wonder as he wrote, the hand stopped, closing upon something. Have you written, forget them? Carton asked. I have. Is that a weapon in your hand? No, I am not armed. What is it in your hand? You shall know directly. Go right on. There are but a few words more. He dictated again. I am thankful that the time has come when I can prove them. That I do so is no subject for regret or grief. As he said these words, with his eyes fixed on the writer, his hand slowly and softly moved down close to the writer's face. The pen dropped from down his fingers on the table, and he looked about him vacantly. What vapour is that? he asked. Vapour? Something that crossed me. Well, I'm conscious of nothing. There can be nothing here. Take up the pen and finish. Hurry, hurry. As if his memory were impaired, or his faculties disordered, the prisoner made an effort to rally his attention. 
as he looked at Carton with clouded eyes and with an altered manner of breathing. Carton, his hand again in his breast, looked steadily at him. Hurry, hurry! The prisoner bent over the paper once more. If it had been otherwise, Carton's hand was again watchfully and softly stealing down. I never should have used the longer opportunity. If it had been otherwise, the hand was at the prisoner's face, I should but have had so much the more to answer for. If it had been otherwise, Carton looked at the pen and saw it was trailing off into unintelligible signs. Carton's hand moved back to his breast no more. The prisoner sprang up with a reproachful look, but Carton's hand was close and firm at his nostrils, and Carton's left arm caught him round the waist. For a few seconds, Darnay faintly struggled with the man who had come to lay down his life for him. But within a minute or so, he was stretched insensible on the ground. Quickly, but with hands as true to the purpose as his heart was, Carton dressed himself in the clothes the prisoner had laid aside, combed back his hair, and tied it with the ribbon the prisoner had worn. Then he softly called, Enter there, come in! And the spy presented himself. You see, said Carton, looking up, as he kneeled on one knee beside the insensible figure, putting the paper in the breast. Is your hazard very great? Now, get assistance and take me to the coach. You? said the spy nervously. Him, man, with whom I have exchanged. You go out at the gate by which you brought me in? Of course. I was weak and faint when you brought me in, and I am fainter now you take me out. The parting interview has overpowered me. Such thing has happened here often and too often. Your life is in your own hands. Now, quick, call assistance. You swear not to betray me, said the trembling spy, as he paused for a last moment. Don't fear me. I will be true to the death. The door closed, and Sidney Carton was left alone. Straining his powers of listening to the utmost, he listened for any sound that might denote suspicion or alarm. There was none. Keys turned, doors clashed, footsteps passed along distant passages. No cry was raised, or hurry made, that seemed unusual. Breathing more freely in a little while, he sat down at the table, and listened again until the clock struck two. Sounds that he was not afraid of, for he divined their meaning, then began to be audible. Several doors were opened in succession, and finally his own. A jailer with a list in his hand looked in, merely saying, Follow me, Evremond. And he followed into a large, dark room at a distance. It was a dark winter day, and what with the shadows within, and what with the shadows without, he could but dimly discern the others who were brought there to have their arms bound. Some were standing, some were seated, some were lamenting and in restless motion, but these were few. The great majority were silent and still, looking fixedly at the ground. As he stood by the wall in a dim corner, a young woman with a slight girlish form and a sweet spare face in which there was no vestige of colour, and large, widely opened, patient eyes, rose from the seat where he had observed her sitting and came to speak to him. Citizen Evremond, she said, touching him with her cold hands, I am a poor little sempstress who was with you in La Force. He murmured for answer, True, I forget what you were accused of. Plots? <laughs> though the just heaven knows I am innocent of any. <laughs> Is it likely? Who would think of plotting with a poor little weak creature like me? The forlorn smile with which she said it so touched him that tears started from his eyes. If I may ride with you, citizen Evremond, will you let me hold your hand? I am not afraid, but I am little and weak, and it will give me more courage. As the patient eyes were lifted to his face, he saw a sudden doubt in them, and then astonishment. He pressed the work-worn, hunger-worn young fingers and touched his lips. Are you dying for him? she whispered. 
and his wife and child. Shh. Yes. Oh, you will let me hold your brave hand, stranger. Shh. Yes, my poor sister. To the last. The same shadows that are falling on the prison are falling in that same hour of the early afternoon on the barrier with a crowd about it when a coach going out of Paris drives up to be examined. Who goes there? Whom have we within? Papers? The papers are handed out and read. Alexandre Manette, physician, French. Which is he? This is he, this helpless, inarticulately murmuring, wandering old man pointed out. Apparently the citizen doctor is not in his right mind. The revolution fever will have been too much for him. Greatly too much for him. Ah, many suffer with it. Lucy, his daughter, French, which is she? This is she. Ah, apparently it must be. Lucy, the wife of Evremont, is it not? It is. Ah, <laughs> Evremont has an assignation as well, eh? Lucy, her child, English. This is she. She and no other. Sidney Carton, advocate, English. Which is he? He lies here, in this corner of the carriage. He too is pointed out. Hmm. Apparently, the English advocate is in a swoon. It is hoped he will recover in the fresh air. It is represented that he is not in strong health and has separated sadly from a friend who is under the displeasure of the Republic. Ah, is that all? It is not a great deal, that. Many are under the displeasure of the Republic and must look out at the little window, huh? Javis Lorry, banker, English. Which is he? I am he, necessarily, being the last. Now behold your papers, Jarvis Lorry, countersigned. One can depart, a citizen? One can depart. Forward, my postilions, a good journey. Along the Paris streets, the death carts rumble, hollow and harsh. Six tumbrils carry the day's wine to La Guillotine. All the devouring and insatiate monsters imagined since imagination could record itself are fused in the one realization. Guillotine. There is a guard of sundry horsemen riding abreast of the tumbrils, and faces are often turned up to some of them, and they are asked some question. Which is every morn, says a man. That, in the back there. With his hand in the girls? Yes. And then cries, down every mound, the guillotine all aristocrats, down every mound. The supposed Evremond descends, and the seamstress is lifted out next after him. He has not relinquished her patient hand in getting out, but still holds it as he promised. He gently places her with her back to the crashing engine that constantly whirs up and falls, and she looks into his face and thanks him. But for you, dear stranger, I should not be so composed, for I am naturally a poor little thing, faint of heart, nor should I have been able to raise my thoughts to him who was put to death, that we might have hope and comfort here today. I think you are sent to me by heaven. She kisses his lips. He kisses hers. They solemnly bless each other. The spare hand does not tremble as he releases it. Nothing worse than a sweet, bright constancy is in the patient face. She goes next before him. He's gone. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, shall never die. The murmuring of many voices, the upturning of many faces, the pressing on of many footsteps in the outskirts of the crowd, so that it swells forward in a mass, like one great heave of water. 
all flashes away. They said of him about the city that night that it was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld there. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. One of the most remarkable sufferers by the same axe, a woman, had asked at the foot of the same scaffold not long before to be allowed to write down the thoughts that were inspiring her. If he had given utterance to his, and they were prophetic, they would have been these. I see long ranks of the new oppressors who have risen on the destruction of the old, perishing by this retributive instrument before it shall cease out of its present use. I see a beautiful city and a brilliant people rising from this abyss, and in their struggles to be truly free, in their triumphs and defeats through long years to come, I see the evil of this time and of the previous time of which this is the natural birth, gradually making expiation for itself and wearing out. I see the lives for which I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous and happy, in that England which I shall see no more. I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts and in the hearts of their descendants generations hence. I see her, an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, lying side by side in their last earthly bed, and I know that each was not more honoured and held sacred in the other's soul than I was in the souls of both. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known.